behind you. Straight right now. Uh, All, right. All right, it should go live right now. It should be live, I think. Mm, yeah, nah, yeah, it's live. It. It's live. Um, can you maybe put the video in the chat in the yeah, Discord? In the Discord, yeah, I'll probably do it. Yeah. Am oh, I on the right page? Hold on. Yeah, it's it's already on. Um, let me. You know what? Let me share it out on Twitter so it's a lot easier. Oh, Alvarez. Yeah. Oh. That's why you schedule, big dog. You'd have had all this yeah, done already. No, I wish I would have done that earlier. And we could have actually shared it out via our channels. Hey man, uh, yeah. prior to it actually going live. Hey, why you guys giving me yeah, shit, man? Hey, be. come on, man. This is the host, man. What, you, what y'all talking about? <laughs> no, <we got> right. <laughs> it's all right, man. It's all right. It's the best yeah. way to grow. You know what I mean? It gets colder real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Jake Rocket, man. I still gotta wait uh, for you to. Did you oh. share it out on? No, I'm about. Twitter? I'm doing that right now. But you live already? Yeah, I'm alive. I don't give a shit. What I you can't find much. it either, huh? <laughs> I'm sitting here. I'm refreshing the page. I cannot find it. I don't know what is going. You gotta, on. you gotta, you gotta put your fake voice on now. Hey, everybody! Uh, nice to meet you guys. Yeah. We're here with. Man, the legendary voice. I don't have a big voice, man. Shit. <laughs> I'm just watching this playthrough on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. I just shared it out. It should be there. Yeah. All right. All right, man. All right. So, started right. it, boy. Yeah. All right, hey, yo, this is Gaming Despair. Fuck my channel, man. Hit the dislike button and uh, make sure you report it. Uh, but anyways, we got uh, panel members. We got my dude, King Thrash, Sick Humor, and lovely Tina. And then uh, we got the man, the myth, the legend, Jeff Ross, man. What's up, my dude? Hey, what's going on with you? Hey, not much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so... I wanted to ask you a specific question just to start it off with. Um, so were you always a gamer growing up? Like, is it just something that just kind of went, like you were thinking about a different career, but it just kind of took you that direction? Or were you always gaming and you were just like, you know what, this is what I'm interested in, this is what I want to do? Yeah, always a gamer. I mean, I'm uh, I'm old enough to uh, still appreciate when Pong was this you know amazing high-res thing. So um, yeah, as a kid, always loved games. Um, uh, you know, from the late seventies on and, but I never really thought it would be a career. And that, that's something that dawned on me in the mid nineties when, uh, do when I bought a copy of doom and you can make levels for it. And, um, they were in Texas. It was the first time it ever dawned on me that people made video games and that there was an actually a career. I don't know why I didn't think that before, but once I, once I figured it, figured it out, I'm like, yeah, that's what I got to do. Um, because at that point, you know, like I, I'd gone to college just for general stuff and, really kind of focused on, you know, uh, literature, film, kind of, you know, so I, I was always kind of into storytelling, but well, couldn't figure out a career for it. Well, and then you're freaking up a little bit. Uh, yeah, so I was always into storytelling. And when when I basically realized that game development could be a career, uh, that's when I'm like, yes, I got to get in and do something like, you know, something that's creative and, where, you know, you can express yourself in a, in a cool, interactive way. So, yeah, it wasn't a long-term plan until a couple of years before I actually got in the industry. Gotcha. But prior to that, did you have any other goals? Like, did you think like, hey, you know, I'm, this is what I'm going to aim for? Because like for me, I wanted to get into programming, but then eventually it turned into real estate. So I didn't know if you had the same thing where it just kind of like, you know, things kind of turned, you know, different. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I wanted to uh, be a filmmaker or a cop, uh, you know, and I, you know, hadn't made headway on either one of those when gaming came along. But those those were probably my plans before games. Shit, man. I wouldn't trust you if you were a cop, man. I would think you'd be Heisenberg from uh, what's that show called? Oh, yeah, yeah, Breaking Bad. Yeah, Breaking for sure. Uh, I would have been a great and terrible cop at the same time. It's weird. I don't know. No, I'm just joking with you. I'm just joking with you. Uh, I got a question. Oh, my bad. Go ahead. No, go my ahead. Bad. No, no, go, go, go. Um, no, I was going to ask, um, since on the same uh, question, um, you said you want to, like, make movies and write stories. Do you have a story? Well, I don't. Well, don't answer this if you can or can't. I don't know. But do you have a story uh, that you haven't made in a game? space yet and if you can share any details if you can 
Oh yeah, no, I've I, I've got one that I've been packing around for about twenty years. I I, I really don't. I can't give it away here, but because uh, somebody will beat me to the punch. And um, I, I feel like it's super original, and it's going to be one of those things. Once somebody makes a game, I've got a story and a concept for mechanics that really adhere to the story. Uh, somebody's going to do what I'm thinking of eventually, and I kind of want to be the first one to. Uh, I want to beat him to the punch because uh, you know, be first or or uh, be best or be both. You know. Oh, yeah. Have you ever maybe considered starting your own studio? Because <clears throat> I yeah, know you I, were. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. For, for sure. And the the thing is, it's really complicated. I'm not a businessman. Uh, there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of hustling involved. That uh, as cool as it would be to own your own studio and kind of run your own thing, it's a uh, it, it really does require a lot of skills that I don't have. That you know, people that I that I would work with uh, would be interested. We don't have, you know, we're game developers, not not uh, entrepreneurs. But um, it would. We thought about it. We've actually kind of taken steps, but then then backed out. So it's a, I, you know, ultimately, really, what I want is uh, it's just a place to make a game where I can help set the vision and, and set how we make it. So I, I don't need to own my own company to do that. Tell you the biggest thing that I see in game development nowadays is is lack of creativity man everything seems like um a, a carbon copy of something else and and i get it you know like ideas in in the gaming industry they're 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 not infinite right um are you the the next thing that you work on do you feel like you're going to be pushing the boundary uh the boundaries of creativity or do you think you're going to stick more to the norm you know, I, th I think that um, there there are a ton of ideas in the industry. It's just that they are dangerous and unproven, <laughs> and that's why we're not seeing them. And that's why you see a lot of open world games kind of fall back on the Far Cry template or the Ubisoft template in a lot of ways, just because there's a uh, a, a tried and true formula there. Right. Um, and it's with, with, when we did Days Gone, you know, we wanted to do a lot of things that were you know against the grain, things like. Uh, Hey man, we're not going to tell the player shit. You know, we're just going to let them. We want players to observe and figure things out and really learn to appreciate all these really cool dynamic systems and how they interact together well and, and create interesting surprises. Um, and even you know, even loading tips or tutorials were were things we didn't want to just. We don't hit the player over the head with things that we kind of felt that they already knew as well. Like, hey, here's your mini map. Use it to find your next thing. So. Um, what what happens is you put your game through user testing and you have a bunch of people stuck. On, on these regular issues, you, and, you know, where they just need, you, you know, you have to dumb the game down in a lot of ways, the more mass market you want to go. So, yeah, um, yeah and just, then I think the more expensive the game, the, the less risk that a publisher is willing to, to incur. Right. Now, you, you just asked a significant question, man. I always wondered if you guys made games a certain way because you felt like we wouldn't be able to, um, you know, kind of make it through those particular games if you, you know, kept it at, you know, such a difficult level. And me personally, man, I've enjoyed the games that really don't hold your hand, you know, like the Demon Souls, the 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 Dark Souls series, uh, any from software game, period. Right, right. Um, yeah, you know, it, but that's their jam is, is you know, their right. audience is coming looking for that. When you're, you're playing the next open world game from Sony, you know, people kind of want some, they want to kind of have some framework that they understand and they're comfortable with. And I, and I think ideally what, you know, the, the best situation for a developer to be in is like, okay, figure out the 80% that, that is going to be, you know, the standard, the conventions, but then find a way to really be radically creative within that final 20% in a way that doesn't, uh, doesn't kind of turn gamers off or scare them away uh, because they've got that 80% that they're familiar with. So I, I think that there is possibility for innovation and in whatever that remainder is. Is that the reason why a lot of developers are getting rid of like difficulty trophies? Like, like, you know, I think that's tied to accessibility. Um, you know, the Last of Us Two, I think, was the first one that really kind of I think was the game changer for that. Where uh, Naughty Dog notoriously has these really hard trophies, and they require multiple playthroughs. You know, with Uncharted Four, I think there are speed runs. Like, it's just they're 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 ridiculously challenging. And uh, with the Last of Us Two. No, it, it, they basically, they, they didn't have the speed run. I, I, I can't remember if he had to do multiple difficulties. But to me, what, what I thought was kind of like the, the sea change was when they, their accessibility options let you override a number of, of difficult, difficulty elements, like the, you know, the, the flank ability, you know, how much an AI would flank. Well, you could tune their, their uh, reaction times from, from the sliders. 
So it was really fascinating to me because I think what we're doing as, a, as an industry is we're going to move away from basically uh, difficulty as a, as a tuning knob for different experiences. You know, because right now story mode is always just easier. Um, some games can come along and say, hey, yeah, man, like there's no open world in this story mode. Like this is just going to go from mission to mission or it's going to, um, you know, it's just going to take it really easy on the player and help guide them to the next mission. Um, I think that that's what games are going to start doing because I think difficulty and challenge are, they're counter to some very positive principles like, like uh, embracing games for everybody. Gotcha. And you know what? Um, I wanted to ask a quick question. Um, for those people that don't know what a game director is, you know, does, right? Like, do you pretty much just oversee what's going on, you know, with the whole company? And if people get out of line, you just kick their ass and shit? Uh, like, <laughs> like, what do you do exactly as a game director? Well, it's, it's different from company to company. And, uh, you know, for us at, at Ben, really, you know, uh, is, you know, I was game director, but we had John Garvin as the creative director. And, and it was, you know, he was co-studio director. It was like, it was his baby. Um, I actually wasn't even promoted to game director until about three years in. And then we moved the design team out from under creative and it, it became its own thing. But um, the, the best metaphor I can use is, uh, you know, the creative director is the architect of the experience, whereas the game director is like the, the contractor, the guy who's going to go off and build it. And, you know, obviously the game director has some agency and you know, he's got ideas that he's feeding into it. But really, um, it's, it's the guy who's building and fin you know, finishing and shipping the game and, and trying to be a representative for the, for the, for the player. And that's how, so that's how it was for Ben. I'm not quite sure how it is everywhere else. Okay, I got a question. Um, you, 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 you game, right? You, you actually game, or do you just make games? Oh, I game. Nah, he game. He game. Oh, you game. Uh, what, what's your um? Well, I don't know if you give out your your gamer tag or anything like that, but I just will always ask, what's the origin? Because like you know, gamers, we have a lot of, uh, you know feel for the the names that we choose in our in our in our gaming space and um do you have an alias on on your gaming space and do you, does it have a history or a uh or a, a rhyme or reason for why it exists yeah well my, my gamer tag is pretty easy to figure out and um you know one of the things i say about my twitter handle is that you know jake rocket uh was a comic that i was a, just a comic strip i was writing and drawing in college and I can't even draw, but I'm like, I want to make a comic like that. I want to start writing comics. And so I don't know how I came up with that combination of words, Jake Rocket. Uh, but <laughs> I think I think it was because of my initials. And um, years later, when I was doing a lot of online gaming, you know, you, you know, you, it was just really tough to find a Jeff Ross variation <laughs> that wasn't taken. So Jake Rocket's generally pretty wide open on anything. So that's just uh, it's been my uh, it's been my handle for years, you know, um, you know, on Twitter, you know, in social media, but also in gaming, you know, when you needed, before before you had an account with trophies, just when, when you needed a name while playing Craig, right. it was, it's been Jake Rocket. Because it's just like my initials and it's kind of close to my name. So it's as simple as that. Yeah, it's similar to mine. Mine is King Thrash and my last name is actually Thrash. Nice. So I just put King in front of it because, <laughs> King, you know what I mean? It's self-descriptive. Self -descriptive. <laughs> but um, I wanted to ask, um, in today's gaming space, in this new generation, have you seen something that just blown you away yet? Like, and I'm not talking about stuff that's not out yet. I'm talking about stuff that did come out, like Horizon, Halo, Ratchet and Clank. Like, has have any of those games blown you away, or do you see this generation growing into something bigger than what we see now? Yeah, all those games, as a matter of fact, are are very impressive and great on their own. And and I will say that we are running the risk of not appreciating what's in front of us. When, when you look at how just how glorious and visually spectacular, you know, the, the latest Ratchet and Clank is, or uh, just how you know brilliant the core design of Returnal is, uh, you know, all these things are, we're, we're getting hit with a lot of great uh, games. It's like the golden age of gaming right now. And uh, we may not have, we all may be so jaded that we're not appreciating what's there. So um, what I would definitely say, because I just played, started playing Halo, and I'm like, yeah, this Halo open world. You know, it's, it's fun, but it's not as impressive as it would have been 10 years ago for some reason, just because there are so many other games out there that are doing some very similar things. So I would say that where, people, where games are really impressing me are on, you know, like The Last of Us 2. Last of Us 2, the storytelling risks that they're taking um, were, to me, fascinating and, and great choices. I know that they're controversial, but um, 
I don't think I've ever played a more cinematic game uh, where you knew the stakes, you know, you, you had these conflicted emotions about each character that you're playing. Uh, you know, at the same time you're traveling through, when you're playing as Abby, sorry for spoilers, and, and you're traveling through the world and, and going through a, a morgue with all the bodies that you killed as Ellie in the first part of the game. It's just, uh, you know, I think that um, obviously the, the animations and the graphics and everything's super top-notch, uh, but the storytelling, it, it's just the choices that they're making are, uh, are what are really setting them apart, and they're doing it boldly. I you know, agree with you. It's, it's crazy. I've talked to so many developers in my life, and I'm going to be honest with you, Jeff. You might be one of the 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 more... I want to say authentic, but then again, I think the word genuine really like like hits on. I feel like when you're talking, no matter what it is that you're saying, that you actually believe the stuff that you're saying. Whereas I've talked to other people and it's like, dude, you don't really feel this way. So <laughs> I, I applaud you for that, man. I, I, I really do. Thanks, dude. It is a blessing and a curse because uh, I think my old boss was afraid of putting me on camera at any point because I do speak my mind and uh, you know, I, th I think, you know, he says, I just will say the most outlandish things. And you know, he's, he's interpreting them all wrong. I just speak what's on my mind. Like one of the, uh, one of the coolest stories that I have from my, my times at Sony was um, when Kojima came around all the Sony studios and to look at engines and evaluate tech. We, you know, he came here, we gave him a big presentation, but then went to dinner later. And then he recounted, I think I asked, uh, you know, through his translator, Hey, what happened with Konami? And he told us, you know, <laughs> you know at the end of it, it was, uh, it, it was something where, you know, nobody knew what to say. There was a dead silence in the room. And uh, I raised my glass and said, all right, here's to fuck Konami. <laughs> and, uh, and there was like the most awkward silence. God, you know, no. There was like Mark Turney, <laughs> Connie Booth, they're all looking around. And then, and then Kojima started laughing and saying, fuck Konami. <laughs> or some, somebody, somebody was saying that, but like, I got the laughs from the people that I needed to. But uh, that was a close call. But it was just the, so it's a blessing and a curse because sometimes not having a filter that could have gone either way. It's really crazy when I hear somebody actually confirm something that we heard as sort of as a rumor too. Because we've all heard that thing about uh, Kojima and him going around to different studios and you know looking at different I guess engines or whatnot. And I never knew if that was really true or if that because. It's hard to trust gaming journalism nowadays. Yes, yeah. no, that, that was yeah. legit, and they were tweeting it the whole way. He and Cerny were, so it, it, it's uh, it's pretty bona fide. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's extra confirmation for you. Gotcha. You you guys use what what engine did you use for um, uh, Days Gone? Was it Unreal Engine? Yeah, Unreal Four. Unreal. Yeah. Let me ask you a question, and you can choose not to answer this or not. Do you think? Days Gone, just performance-wise, would have turned out better with the newer Unreal Engine 5? Or was it not the limitations of the engine that may have caused you guys, you know, some performance issues? You know, it's, it's hard to say. They're making a lot of strides with Unreal 5, and, and it, they're tailoring it towards open world. I've actually worked with it a little bit, and it's pretty slick. Mm -hmm. um, Unreal 4, definitely, there weren't a lot of open world games. That came out on that. It was it was a challenge. So I, I wouldn't lay it all at, at the engine level. I mean, I think that the uh, the problem that we ran into was um, not a lot of people understand how it works. You know, deep down, if, if if it's an engine that you own internally, your engineers understand it from the kernel up. Like they understand every aspect of it, what the performance implications of every single thing are. With Unreal, there's there are a lot of tools. There's some profiling tools, but uh, nobody really has a strong command of the inner guts and working of it at least you know uh, at least we didn't and i don't think a lot of developers i don't i don't think it's something that's that's not a bad thing i think that's just a normal thing because it is such a complex monolithic engine that it comes with a lot of things that you just have to you have to understand even whether you're using them or not so you know maybe it would have performed better but um uh it i don't know i i just think that um it wasn't unreal 4 necessarily it was just the first open, the first big open world game that really kind of came out and, and and pushed it to the best of my knowledge. You know, I want to ask you one more question, and then I'm going to shut up and let everybody else ask whatever their questions are. <laughs> you might be able to answer this, or you might not be able to answer this, and this is nothing legally wise or anything like that. But I'm I'm just curious to know 
When I played Days Gone, I had absolutely no issues with the game until that 1.06 patch came out and just kind of, I don't know what happened. It just, it, it started making the game unplayable for me. But how how is it that even in the console world where there's only maybe one or two SKUs that you guys have to work on, that everybody seems to be experiencing totally different things? Because I was like telling people like, dude, I streamed this entire game, bro. I didn't have any <laughs> issues with this game. But then there was other people like, yo, this game never worked from the beginning. And I'm like, whoa, no, something is wrong there. Is that something that you can explain away or is that maybe on the, the, the engineering level? The, the best way that I could explain it away is you all saw that scene from Jurassic Park where uh, Jeff Goldblum explains chaos by dropping the with a drop of water on his hand and explaining about all the variables in play, the wind, the temperature, yeah. the air follicles, how that leads to chaos. That I, so I'm simplifying things, obviously, but um, it, even though it is a, a, a locked target, there's still variability in, in SKUs. You know, there's, some, there's some variability. There's variability in the age of the hardware. You know, if, you're, if you're playing something on, a, on an old PS4, uh, you, know, like you, might, you might be prone to... Um, some performance issues like it may not have the uh the you know it may not be the hard drive might not have the same you know i can't explain the technical part of it but basically there is variability in the same hardware just by age and i know that when naughty dog was shipping an uncharted 3 i read about this that um they were testing on newer playstation 3 models and then once they started doing broader testing they realized that they had huge streaming problems and it was because once it once it got on older ps3s at the time so they really had to kind of go through and kind of you know kind of reconfigure their game to kind of to, to take care of that so you are right it should be a target you know single skew or single target uh it, with sony being ps4 pro ps4 ps5 that's obviously challenged but it's certainly an easier problem than pc developers or or developers on a multitude of targets but ultimately it comes down to complexity of software is just getting um crazier and crazier these games um they're they're doing a lot uh, and it's tough to anticipate the way everything will interact with one another and um yeah, people when they have bugs, it seems like you know if, if you're if you're prone to having bugs with like our game, you're gonna have a lot of, of bugs. And if you're not, if, you know if it's running well, it's probably gonna run well. And then yeah. um, and then there's also just the people who turned off their console between play sessions uh, had far better experience than people that put it in into sleep mode, which is too bad. Man, I did like 12, 13 hour sessions, man. I'm not going to even lie to you. I was so lost in this world. That's why I was kind of let down when I heard that there wouldn't be a Days Gone 2. Um, hopefully that changes in the future. But man, I, that, that was a real letdown for me. Um, yeah, especially gosh, um, was... especially with the secret ending at the end. And you yeah. saw yeah, one of the creatures. That's what I'm uh, I was like, man, where is this series going to fucking head to? I want to see what the fuck next, you know, the next day's going to is. And then all of a sudden I'm like, ah, no, what the hell? Jeff Ross is leaving and now. Fucking no day's gone to some bullshit. So, <laughs> Jeff, can I ask you one more question? And I know I just said last time that it would oh, be go one ahead, more man. question. That's all you want, dude. One more question, man. Um, How do you feel? And, and, Again, this is just a personal opinion. I'm not trying to get you to say anything crazy towards like Sony or anything like that. But how do you feel about Days Gone going to PC? And if it was up to you, would you have done that while you were, you know, at at Sony Bend at that time if you could make that decision? Did it come to did it come as a surprise to you? And do you think that that's beneficial to uh PlayStation overall? Because I got some 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 words to say about that, and I don't really feel that great about stuff like that going to PC, but I can most certainly understand why they would. But I guess my question to you is, would you have made that decision if it was up to you? Uh, yeah, no, as a matter of fact, I was there when that decision was made, and I was part of it. So um, so that answers the next part of the question, which is, I'm, I'm all for it. I mean, I think that um, as a developer who's made games on dead hardware now, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, you know, like the Vita, you, you know, it's like nobody's going to, at a certain point, all Vitas are going to stop working and then Golden Abyss will not, nobody will be able to play it. I mean, I think there might be emulators, but um, I, I think it's good just so games can be, you know, I think if you build something, you want a large audience, you want as many people to play it as possible. So finding a secondary market for it, um, I, I think is a good thing. Uh, now it's not for me because uh, I'm, my muscle memory is so baked into that controller 
playing Days Gone for thousands, thousands of hours probably, that when I try to play it on a keyboard, I just, I lose it. But there are people out there that are, you know, keyboard and mouse all the way and they make it work. So um, it's not quite the same experience for me, it's just based on that. I mean, I have, I could plug in a controller, but um, no, I think it's a good thing. It, it's a good thing for developers to make a little extra money for the people who just can't find or, you know, they, they don't want to buy a PS4 or they want, they, they've got a PS4, PS5, but they also love the high-end graphic configuration. It's a good, it's a net good thing for everybody. I think some of the fear that people had about, you know, PlayStation game going to PC was like the whole day and date thing because some of us were thinking that maybe it could sacrifice the quality of like how PlayStation games are. You know, we, we thought that maybe probably the proper idea would be to fully develop a game on on the new PlayStation hardware and then, you know, focus on, you know, PC later afterwards. Absolutely. I think that, you know, being if it were if it were day one, that would be weird. Uh, if it was out at the same time, you know, because we are here to sell PlayStations. And, you know, so but releasing it at some period later, you know, movies do this. They, you know, they, they run in theaters, but then they have DVD and cable and direct, you know, uh, uh, you know, basically video on demand deals. They, those are all revenue channels for the, for the developers. And I think it's it's good for business. It's good for the team. It's good for, you know, it's good for people who want to play this game. We just don't have the primary hardware. But, but day one would be a game changer. That would that would kind of break things in in, in my book. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. That, that, that's that's kind of the conversations that that we have anyway. And you know, we never really get like the way the developers feel about this because some people don't really want to talk about it. Or you know, when the subject comes up, it's like, hey man, I'm just here to make video games. Like whatever happens to them, like that's on them. But I've always thought about that. And, and me personally, I feel like the PlayStation should be the primary platform. Now, let me not get it twisted. I do have a gaming PC, a very good gaming PC. And I still prefer my PlayStation to play my video games. Um, my thing is, I feel like, let's just say like with God of War, I think God of War was a terrible rollout for PC. Let me explain to you why. I, I get it. It's been years since the game released on PlayStation, but I feel like the rollout should have been, since it's going to PC, then we want to give our PS5 players who purchased the PS5 an updated version of God of War simultaneously with the release of PC. Because now the, the, the comparisons that we have being made don't even make sense. People are comparing PS5 ports of God of War, which is essentially the PS4 version of the game, to uh, the, the, the game that was created specifically for PC to maximize, you know, um, the, 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 the fidelity, the performance and everything like that. And I think that that's a stupid comparison. It's a weird comparison and it doesn't really do you any good as a platform holder. Am I am I missing there, Jake, or it, it, am I just too embedded in my fanboyism? Because, you know, anytime. <laughs> something you're just considered a fanboy if i say i don't want people on pc to have something day and date then i'm just a fanboy not the fact that i want this platform to survive and if you guys get the sh the stuff after the fact then cool you know i'm not i'm not i'm not crying about that i'm just saying we should be front row and center anytime it, anytime it comes to porting over because i feel like what they did with uncharted was the perfect rollout Yes, we're releasing Uncharted 4 and Lost Legacy on PC, but let's make sure we get our PlayStation 5 owners. Let's let's get them taken care of first. And then we'll put this on PC. Am I missing? Am I just simply a fanboy? Let me know. Yeah, I, I you know, I think uh, there's something in the middle here is it's just really tough for a developer to to, uh, to go back and touch something, you know. So I have no idea how, how it happened with Santa Monica. But um, for Days Gone, we were working in, you know, since Unreal is, is great for deploying to different targets, we were able to kind of work within the same chain. So I, I, and since I wasn't there when it shipped, I'm not sure how much of that stuff rolled back into another patch. But um, it is work. They had a team on that for, you know, got at least a year working on it. And... Um, that was for the PC version, for to, you know, for them to kind of roll that back up into the into the, the PS4, PS5 skew. I just think it's uh, do you want do you want the next God of War or do you want that? <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. I, I don't have anything else to say. Well, I oh. do have more questions, but I'm going to shut up because I've been asking way too many questions. So. Yeah, you have. Um, nah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a question about. 
I mean, I, I make a lot of videos on journalism, and I feel that journalism is hurting gaming more than helping it, especially with the news, because I guess news isn't news anymore. They don't investigate anymore. They don't they don't uh, solidify what they're saying anymore. They're more or less just having a conversation, but typing it. And you see a lot of, you know, a lot of guesswork, a lot of I think this or I believe that. And I think it muddies what's real and what's not real. Yep. And <clears throat> then there's Metacritic, which can openly, which which can sadly affect um, how a game sells based on these same journalists who don't even some of which don't even play the game i mean we're just now finding out a lot of people um play one game but they all share it and they're all like put it into one bundle which is crazy but i noticed that metacritic does a lot to a game and i i, I was one to say uh days gone was going to get a 70 on metacritic and i didn't and i said it not based on how good the game was going to be, but just how journalists act, especially when it comes to open world games. Yeah, and I was right, and it was sad to see because I know I have played the game. I mean, I've, we've we've seen game um, GameSpot's review and didn't make no sense at all. Um, do you think Metacritic is something that is affecting gaming in a negative way simply because there is no structure there to tell people, okay, this is how you should review a game? You know what I mean? You know, like it, it adds a layer of stress, and there's some there's some game companies and publishers where the Metacritic score can factor into the financials. But you know, for us, we knew that we wanted to be oh god, I forget, like you know, eighty plus. And um, there's no real way to know. Like you're going off your gut trying to figure it out. So what 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 the publishers now do is they put something through what they call mock reviews, and uh, these mock reviews have some sort of process where. They're going to go through it, and they guarantee you basically a plus minus three points of the of the final Metacritic. So we did uh, we did at least three mock tests for us, and it, they came back just like the Metacritic. They were everywhere. <laughs> you know, one was really high, one was really low, <laughs> one was kind of in the middle. So you mm -hmm. know, it, it, in a sense, those three, you know, none of them were within the point score, the the point threshold that they promised. But mm -hmm. I, th I think the three of them together kind of showed the polarity of the way that the world received it. And, you know, I, th I think that um, all I would ask for, you know, like, I'm, it, and for the record, I'm one of the few developers that have talked about this that, you know, don't, I, I don't blame the critics, at, you know, at all. I think that um, they, they did their job. I, I think, you know, I could get into, you know, a conversation about the way that they do their job that can maybe change. But, um, you know, I think what Days Gone did was it came out, it was broken. It, you know, it wasn't, it, obviously, I'm a huge fan of Days Gone. I think it's great. But it's a slow burn. And, you know, people who uh, people who play it for a couple hours don't get it. People who play it for you know, people who play it for a continuous period of state and, and enjoy the slow burn. At a certain point, they get locked in. Now, that's our fault. You know, we, we wanted the slow burn, but we could have shaved off a lot more uh, kind of friction on the golden path to get players to the, the more emotional parts of the story uh, quicker. But um, so, you know, it's it's our fault. Uh, you know, we we screwed up. We did a lot of things right too, but you know that was definitely a miscalculation. Honestly, and, uh, honestly, Jeff, I liked it the way it was. To be honest with you, I mean, I had fun since I started it all the way to the end and got the platinum. I, I think I, I thought it was just what I expected it to be. To be honest with you, I had so much fun with the game. I kept ranting it about my friends, and then you know they started buying it. And you know, I just had a lot of fun with the game. I don't think you guys did anything wrong. I think it's just the journalists no, that kind of messed you guys up. There are no right answers, and you know, when it, when it comes to um, the, the, the methods that, that a lot of review sites uses. All I ask is um, just have the people, you know, have a target. The reviewer should somebody who would, in, in, in the normal world, would be somebody who would consider buying and playing this game. But if it's, just a, if it's just an editor who doesn't love open world games, which happened in a few cases, where they, uh, you know, at least one case, somebody said, yeah, I don't like, I don't even like open world games, but I'm reviewing this. It's like, come on, give me a break. <laughs> Give yeah. us a shot. I mean that too. Yeah. There's a lot of freelance yeah. writers out there who are writing about these games, and I don't think they're even playing them. And that's yeah, you know, I, I, I'm not going to accuse them of that, but you know, because you know, they we we did look at data for um, some some of the players or some of the reviewers, the telemetry data which we had turned on at that time, and you could see. And again, the, I think this goes back to the you know the the product has to be compelling to a, a, a broad array of people if you want to be successful in the mass market, and in in this case. 
uh, you know, you got a bunch of jaded journalists, you know, who have a million games to play. And, you know, if your game isn't grabbing them, then uh, your game is going to suffer because they're, they're going to start to resent it. But we did look, we did look at data where you know, like one guy or one, one person played the, you know, played the game for about five, six hours uh, one day and then played it for a couple hours the next day and then went dark for like a week and a half. But then a day or two before the reviews were, before the embargo was lifted, they went back and finished it all within a day. And it's like, that's not how people typically play these things. So you're like, you know, you're not, that's not, in, that's not indicative of the actual experience for most people. And, right. it, you know, so I think that those are the things I would ask. Another one was, I can't, I, I met a, one of the editors of a magazine, uh, you know, years later and he's like, oh, I mean, yeah, uh, so-and-so, it was his game of the year. And I'm like, why didn't you have him review it for the magazine? <laughs> it's like, what, what did you give to this other guy? Like, it's, uh, you know, and that, that's kind of packing the, you know, the reviews on your site. But it, all I ask was, is it somebody who would be a viable customer for that product in the real world? If you, if you can, like, make a structure on how a game should re be reviewed from your view as a developer, what do you think they should actually be looking at to, um, to measure quality? Or, or however they want to measure it. Like, what do you think? Like, I've noticed a lot of people, like, like old girl on GameSpot was mad because Deacon liked his wife's ass. And I'm like, well, you're supposed to like your wife's ass. Like, I don't even understand it. But she didn't <laughs> like that. Aspect. I don't believe that should even be in a review. That's your own personal thoughts on what you think this man should have said to this woman. Regard, rather than, you know, how, how many enemies were on screen or how many, you know, the, the, the combat tree or whatever. Like, you know, things that are actually for the game. Um, is there a structure that you think that there should be, or, or is it something that people should look at when doing reviews or, or is it fine how it is? Yeah. I, I think the, the reason why you have a multitude of reviews is for a broad range of subjective takes on something. So, um, you know, you go back and look at literature today that we, that we, that people will say, this is a classic, uh, so you, I'll pull up a Hemingway sun also rises is today considered a classic of American literature. If you go back and look at the reviews, it was panned when it came out, you know, it, because it, it, it went against the sensibilities of the, of the era. And, you know, some would say that that was one of the strengths of the novel. Uh, but, the, you know, the reviewers, it took them some time to be able to kind of appreciate this advancement of, of storytelling methods in the way that Hemingway wrote. So um, I, I think it's a good thing. You know, I think that, uh, you know, you want... You know, when, when I read reviews, I'm not looking for the, the score. I'm looking for what's being said about it. And that's what you want. The, I think that's what you want the conversation to be is um, mm -hmm. somebody having a monologue about, you know, what they what they experienced and how they felt about it. And if you read their work regularly, you can start to get a sense of, oh, OK, like the, I, they said this about this game and I played that game and I agreed. So I get a sense that I'm going to like this other game. But the straight up and down, like a Siskel and Ebert, you know, that's not that's not a good system. It's the content of what they're saying that I think people, the you know, should be looking at. But now, having said that, uh, most people just look at the score, and you know, so in, in, in that regard, it that's where it starts to get uncool. But if it was just a structured uh, list of technical merit and polish and fun, like you know, there's you you don't need that many reviewers for that. Um, so again, I just wish the reviewers themselves were. You know, they should always be somebody who is likely to be a fan of a game. And, and appreciate, I think this is one question that they should ask is, what is this game trying to achieve? What are they, what are they marketing to people? And let's go test that question and see if they're delivering on it. Because, um, you know, if, uh, if you play Last of Us 2, one of the best games I've ever played, what if I started that up and said, man, you know, I want to play a white dude. Uh, you know, I want to play an old biker white guy. How come I don't have that if this game sucks? You know, that's when, when the discourse gets to that level is when I think it is, is when, you know, we're off in, 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 in the wrong place. Right. That, yeah, I believe that. Kind of I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know, no, it, that ahead. reminds me of that one journalist and that up saying why all the freakers were white. And you guys pretty much explained it, that it was um, it was like this uh, disease and it was like uh, messing up their skin and stuff. That's why they ended up changing that color. But they didn't yeah. get that far into the game to, you know, say that. So it's kind of crazy how journalism works sometimes. It's kind of like, you know, you go into the movies, right? And you're watching, let's just say, Spider-Man uh, No Way Home, right? You only watch it for 30 minutes. You're like, oh, I got the gist of it. I'm going to write a review about it and just fucking walk out the theater. It's some right. bullshit. Right. Oh, Sorry, ahead. was there a question? Wait, you, wait, hold on. You guys didn't hear me? No, you no, we heard you. up a little bit. Oh, no, no. I was going to say uh, Thrash. Uh, you had a question? Oh, no, no, it was sick. Sick was, sick was going to say something. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sick. What, was, what was the question you was going to ask on it? 
Well, it, it's not necessarily a statement. I mean, uh, it's not necessarily a question, but more of a statement. I mean, you know, some of these, I personally don't take Metacritic serious at all. I don't use it in any form or fashion when I'm choosing to purchase whatever I purchase. Because it, it seems like, it, it seems more like people are moving with agendas than anything. It's like, oh, well, you didn't include this, so no, this is a this is a six or this is a this is a five because you didn't include something that they believe should be included. And it's it, it's getting kind of weird because now you as a creative, I have to ask, like, how do y'all even form the game that you want to make? Because at this point, it's like, yo, we got to start checking off some boxes. You know, like, uh, we got to have at least uh, one trans character or one gay character or one black character, you know, and, and it, it's, it, it, it seems more like things would be forced than anything. I understand inclusion, but come on, man. I'm black. I never wake up and be like, yo, man, this, this video game character, why is he black? <laughs> try to appreciate the game for what it is. Yeah, and I, no, the- that, that's that's the gist of it. Is if it's you know it's a story about somebody, and it, it's pointless to discuss the things that 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 character is not, because that's clearly not a choice that was made. So uh, yeah, no. It when when it becomes an agenda that's out of left field, that's one thing. But um, I think the worst case is if a game if a game sets out to you know somehow be I don't even know how they would say this, but like wants to be the most progressive game on the planet and wants everybody to be able to play and nobody you know wants everybody to have fun and you know. Uh, mechanical fun but also interactive fun and story fun you know so if that's what a game sets out to do and then it's just filled with uh angry white guys from from central oregon and bikers it's <laughs> failing at its admission so i think that you know i think that you have to make these choices based on the higher level story that you're trying to tell whatever that whatever that agenda is or objective is things have to kind of flow out of it and you know i, I don't think that they're generally a random series of choices they're choice you know they're 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 integrated into a larger idea, but when people take issue with that idea and then apply that to the whole game, that, that that's when you kind of get into a tailspin as far as kind of you know what are we talking about? Are we talking about the game? Or are we talking about something else? Yeah, like the personal politics is is stupid to me, man. Like I uh, again, I get the whole everybody wants to be included thing, but if you're gonna make a game based on like I don't know inner city urban areas, then okay, that's what the game is gonna be about. Right. But I'm not going to be sitting up here like, well, well, why isn't there many white people in this particular game? Like, I just don't even understand the concept of how you can judge a game. Be like, oh, man, another game with another gruff white male. And I'm just like, come on, dog. Like, is this really what we about to do, man? Like, come on, man. Like, what are we talking about? I seen somebody say about God of War, (laughs) the PC version, talking about he's not loving enough i'm like what the hell are you talking about like do you not know who kratos is <laughs> kratos is the god of what what is you talking about he's not loving enough and then i went down that reviewers list of reviews and i realized this is a game she should have never reviewed these aren't even the type of games that she play so that's yeah. unfair to you guys, the developers, that totally your agree. game is getting to getting into the hands of somebody who want to play Animal Crossing, but you got violence in your game. So automatically, that's going to go against what they actually like. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, you preach to the choir, dude. Uh, and that's why I said, you know, you got to be a fan of open worlds if you're going to play the open world zombie game. You can't be on the record for hating open world games. That's just not a good start. Yeah, totally agree. With, <laughs> totally agree with that. Definitely, I think. I uh, hopefully, hopefully, this type of behavior that we've been seeing, because I, I come from. I mean, I, I could say most of us. I don't know how old uh, Despair is. You might be a little youngin. Uh, but three. oh yeah, you old enough to where we we've been gaming before this social media internet age, to where like I've never like. Before before social media, I would never hear anything about politics. This this gaming is supposed to be the escape from the craziness of this planet, you know. And it, uh, um, and it's it was re- it's really important. It was really important to me even growing up, growing up in the hood and dealing with different crazy stuff outside. I mean, playing video games was a way to escape of all, escape all of that. And now you see this generation of people talking 
the same politics that supposed to you're supposed to be escaping from. Um, I, I see gaming as ones and zeros. I see gaming gaming as fictional. I see gaming as art, most of all. And you can't tell an artist how to draw. You know what I mean? You gotta let an artist do his work, his or her work, the way they they want it to be done. But to nitpick and say, "Oh, Elias, Elias kissing on Dino. Oh my God! Or oh my God, Joel died. Yet, yeah, how about you pay attention to what the message is in the game? Pay attention to what this game is about, yep. uh, and enjoy it. You know, you're you're forcing yourself to not enjoy gaming by walking in with a political mind. You're not even supposed to walk into gaming. Imagine playing Pac Man with a political mind. Like God, these fucking ghosts are blue. You know, like it's just." I, I I can't I can't understand today's gamers now, but I can't even call them gamers to be honest, man. I just I just or Mario. See. We we played yeah. as an Italian plumber for years, yeah. and nobody was like, "Yo, why yeah. is this guy not black? Yeah. Or, Another or why is he not Chinese?" <laughs> <laughs> so you know, guys, I, I will still go back to even though you know I I should be the most you know I could be bitter about uh, you know the score. Everything you talked about, film, art, literature. It's all highly subjective in everything in its era. I mean, there's obviously clear cut, you know, darling, critical darlings. But, you know, Andy Warhol, go back and look at some, you know, if you can find them, go back and read some contemporary reviews for when he was just starting out. People are probably saying, what the fuck is this stuff this guy's making? Like, there's the, the Hemingway example I talk about, probably F. Scott Fitzgerald. Like, people don't appreciate these books at the time. And that's part of the discourse. You know, the, the discourse is about how, how, you know, those, you know, that art, those, or those books are actually changing and evolving the society and culture and the way the books are written. But it's often very difficult for, for uh, the reviewers to appreciate them in their time and in, their, in, in the moment. So I think that, I don't think you can change that. I don't think that you should. Otherwise, we wouldn't need 40 different reviews of a game. You know, like it, the, the subjectivity is the thing. Like we covered earlier, I just think it's got to be, they got to set you up for the best possible reception. Uh, and then let you, and then let you, uh, destroy your score, not let them just, you know, not lose 20 points just because you gave it to the wrong reviewer. Mm-hmm. I, 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 got a, I, got, I got a question to ask, but this is just back in, gosh, when was it? It had to be like 20... When did Days Going come out? 2019? Yep. It came out 2019, so this had to be like maybe the year prior to it coming out. You were at the Tokyo Game Show. And you were, um, I believe that was you that was actually demoing um, Days oh, Gone. Yeah. It was 2016 E3, I believe, actually. No, no, this was the Tokyo Game Show. Oh, Everything really? was in Japanese. Yes, yes. Oh. And <laughs> Jeff looked like he was so uncomfortable up there, like he was just ready for it to be over. <laughs> were you, did you want to be there at that time? Or or was I just <laughs> looking at it in no. a different way? <laughs> uh, you know, so... <laughs> I loved being there. Loved doing it. Like you know, uh, and even the 2016 E3 demo was 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 amazing and fun to do and like terrifying at the same time. But by the time I got to Tokyo Game Show, I'd been doing you know I, I was super comfortable with a lot of it. But um, I was just tired. You know, like you get jet lagged. You know, I, I think I mismanaged my sleep on the way over, so I was just in a fog most of that time. But uh, it was a little bit stressful because we had this playthrough where I think it was doing two different things. And what they for some reason somebody came up with the idea that like oh you should die. Um, just to kind of show people how dangerous this game is, right? So that was like a last-minute note that the studio director gave me, and uh, and I hadn't practiced it, so I was maybe a little bit nervous about that. Um, but th- but then uh, recently there had been a problem with uh, grenades. Uh, th- you know, b- before the Tokyo Game Show, I had asked the design team to go through and make it so that the uh, thrown grenades detonated a little bit sooner because I was really missing a lot of shots, you know, a lot of tosses with them, and uh, so I'm like, oh, please put this in. And they put the, the, the fix in right before I left for Tokyo. <laughs> you know, so I wasn't playing used to it. And I think one point, because uh, I did two maps, I did the Crazy Willies and then the, the one of the hordes. And on the horde map, um, I played it awesome. But there was a moment where I, I threw the grenade in front of me, which I had always been doing, you know, because I knew the timing. And uh, it blew up sooner than I expected and knocked me on my ass. And I was like, oh, this could be it. <laughs> but, I, you know, I got up and managed to run away. So... Uh, you know, a little nervous, but mostly just kind of tired and, and uh, hung, or you know, basically uh, jet lag. Yeah, you look like you was out of it, man. I was like, dude, he does not <laughs> look like he feel like being there right now, man. Uh, no, I, I, love, I, I, I loved it. I couldn't prove it though. I was just like thinking it in my head, like, dude, he doesn't look like he wants to be there at all. Nah, it was fun. 
It's always a little more uh, crafty one. If you could work on any, I guess, superhero IP, would you be interested in any of them? You know, I don't think so. I think uh, it's not really my wheelhouse. And if I were if I were to do something with superheroes, I wouldn't want to be bound by the license holder. So it, you know, if I were going to do a superhero game, it would have to be something that was original. You know, not not part of the DC or Marvel universes. Just because yeah, that does not sound like fun. And, and, and more importantly, I really, you know, Unbreakable is one of the greatest movies of all time, if you ask me. And it's a freaking sleeper superhero movie you didn't even know you were watching. And, and right. I really like that. I like the darkness. I like the, just the funk that, that Bruce Willis's character was in. He was kind of a schlubby loser, his kid and wife. You know, like she didn't love him anymore. The kid was losing respect for him. And he was like this giant. So I, I would want to do something a little bit unconventional and surprising like that. If you could work on any other game or, I mean, I'm sure you're going to work on something else in the future. Do you want it to be another open world game? Do you want to maybe try something first person or do you want to stick to the third person and maybe do something else in that type of um, capacity? Or have you even thought about it? Yeah, you know, I've given a lot of thought. And, you know, first person or third person, that's a distinction that, you know, it's important. But um Third person, just you connect with a character so much better. You know, uh, first person might be easier. You don't have to sell so many animations, you know, to do it. You know, because when you're doing third person, if you want to interact with something, you've got to you've got to design that interaction and work closely with animation and make sure it feels good and it's not awkward and all this. So um, first person might help with that. I don't really know. I've never made a first person game. But um, w until we made Days Gone, I'd worked on nothing but mission-based kind of you know linear mission-based quarter crawls that were narrative heavy and um oh i did work on dark watch as a first person shooter but i wasn't closely involved in the mechanics of that one but uh yeah i, I think that until we made days gone we had just been making these simple games and creating this open world with a lot of systems in play uh, you know we we basically had to learn a lot the design team had i had to learn a lot i had to level up as a designer to figure out how we were going to build all these systems and make everything kind of interconnect so um, part of the reason why I left Sony was we weren't going to make a game like that. And it was going to be backward. We were going to be basically going backwards and um, kind of going back to how we used to build games. And I felt like we were just scratching the surface of open worlds and a systemic game and what that could mean. And, that, you know, as a designer, I'm poised to continue forward in that space and, you know, creating really interesting systems. It doesn't have to be open world, but I don't see how... You know, in open world, you know, I would, that would be my choice, but it doesn't have to be that. But Days Gone is a huge open world, man. Like, I can't yeah. believe for a second you guys are just going to abandon that world. Like, like it, it wouldn't make sense because it looks like you guys put a lot of time and effort into it. Even if you made a game that was based in that universe, but not necessarily Days Gone, I would say that that's probably the way you guys should go. You know, I mean, no, no use in actually wasting this world is what I'm saying. For sure. And, you know, or wasting the progress and all the lessons that we learned and the momentum that we had. It's a yeah, it is a travesty. Got a question from the audience. They want to know, um, was Bend using Decimo when they uh, when you left? No. I don't know where that one came from. Like, I don't imagine everybody's going to be using a Decima engine, but um, I. I, I guess I'm out of questions. I guess oh, I'm gonna lean on, on uh, Thrash and, and Remnant, man. Yeah, hold on, Spidey Cat. Oh. Man, you've been pretty quiet. You know why? Because I think Spidey Cat <laughs> was one of the QA tested for Days Gone and didn't catch the. Gross. No, I'm just kidding. No, but um, I, I have a question for that. Like, did you guys notice the bugs in Days Gone before you guys launched it out, or was it just something that you guys were kind of pushed to push the game out? You know what I mean? Like, you guys didn't get a little bit of extra time just to finish it out, like the little extra bugs? Because, like, me personally, when I played the game, I didn't really I didn't really uh, see any bugs. I didn't have any crashes, nothing like that. The only thing that I had was just some frame droppings in the last uh, portion of the game uh, once you're leaving out the camp. But after that, it just ran smooth for me. Like, I, I don't know the other problems the other people had, so... Is that aimed at Jeff or me? <laughs> <laughs> I was just kidding, Tina. <laughs> um... I mean, I think when you release any game, there's bugs in it. It's just the truth, I guess. But QA did a pretty thorough job at picking up as many as they could. So I'm glad to hear that there wasn't too many when you played through it, though. Yeah, definitely. It that's played pretty cool. fine for me. <laughs> and uh, that's why I was asking Jeff. Like, like Jeff, uh, do you guys see these 
bugs like as soon as the game launches do you guys notice them afterwards because i noticed that sometimes when you fix something something else breaks uh just like with anything you know so i don't know if yeah. you guys were aware of the whole situation with that well you, you know the bugs themselves i think that we'd seen you know here or there but going on such a large scale with with the audiences they're playing it you're just you know basically all the edge cases are getting uh you know more opportunities to emerge and um you know, I, I will say that it was surprising how some how shitty some experiences were for people. Like, you know, that that never surfaced within my within my sphere uh, of of influence with the studio. Um, you know, and you asked earlier, kind of like why you know why we have uh, basically dev kits and all this, and how we're, you know we're, we're on a standard we target hardware. All, all true, and kind of part of that is the. And Christina could probably speak to this a little bit more, but there's uh, there's QA, but then there's third party within inside the, the publisher and it, 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 the platform holder because you know um theoretically they, it's a it's a walled garden and everything that goes on there gets uh is, is sanctioned or approved and it has to go through this third party channel where they're kind of they're they're objective you can't say hey buddy we wait for the same company please just let this slide so there it's very rigid rules and you know as a designer one of the things that i was under the most pressure for was uh our trophies better work, <laughs> you know, because if, if in this one trophy, because there's the, the big the big final week of what they call format, uh, you know, the final format QA, and you have to pass that or you're not coming out. And if you are on day five of seven and something comes up, they will kick you out. You have to fix a bug and you have to resubmit and then rewait the whole week. So, um, you know, for trophies, we, that's why we simplified them, just to kind of make sure that they weren't these big, long, you know, kind of grinds you had to do that would take format QA longer than a week to test. And I, that ultimately worked out best for the player, by the way. I appreciate but, um, that. Yeah, I'm no, same here. Same here. That right now. <laughs> you know, but it, with, with that, without that kind of threat hanging over me, you know, we might have leaned into some kind of tougher trophy. So that that did that was I'm I'm glad we didn't. So um, yeah, you know, I said we saw these bugs. The you know the but not on the scale and severity that they wound up being. You know, and if if um, format if the company had detected it, they would have shut it down. So. Um, because you can't really, you know, you get you get some affordances or some kind of allotments of okay, you can you can uh, a certain bug might be worth five points, another bug might be worth one or two, or but it, past a certain point threshold, you're kicked out, and you have to start, you have to basically fix it and then resubmit it. And it's genuinely like QA anywhere else you work. I see. <laughs> <laughs> I got to uh, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I got, I got a question. It's a little deep, so if you can't answer it, I understand completely. It's just always been on my mind seeing how gaming is going. Um, traditional way of making games is, um, correct me if I'm wrong, it's to get gamers to buy games or sell, to sell units. And the way you do that is to, to attract gamers to it. And like you said earlier, it's um, games are getting easier because it opens the... Uh, it opens to a broader audience. In mainstream gaming, um, you know, there's just some gamers who just will not play a game because if they if they feel it's too hard, right? Um, but <clears throat> that's for developers making games towards gamers. But let's say that the world turns into this streaming world. I don't I don't think a lot of gamers really care for it, but to where all games are streamed and delivered through the service provider, will that affect? the quality of a game if a developer is making a game based on trying to sell the game to the service provider and getting money from the service provider um if everything was streamed and let the service provider worry about getting their subscriptions over what it is today to where um games are being developed per, developed to sell per unit and to get that per unit sale it has to be attractive to the gamer if i said that right yeah, interesting question, and you know, if if I understand it properly, um, I, I guess the only you know my my take on this is, um, yeah, it would change in some way. Would it would it negate the value of this this title on other platforms later? I don't know. It depends on on the choices they are making, but um, I think we can we can watch this trend play out in real time over the next couple of years um, with with Game Pass because there you know there is the promise of. Hey man, we don't even, we, you know, we're not even selling units anymore. We're just, we need to be another bit of content on this thing that's going to, you know, promise people up to fifty hours of play if they want it. Um, of course, we want it to be good, but like, I, I, I really do wonder if that's going to, how that's going to impact 
the choices we make because you you may not if you're not worried about sales maybe you can make some of those more obscure dangerous choices where you're trying to you're trying to be a little a uh, little uh, kind of less conventional and um that might be the space to do it and it could you know i think that it could be a good thing for it you know for that type of uh risk taking um and you know i don't know i think we just have to watch it play out but i think that i think it could be a good thing if 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 uh, developers weren't so worried about sales and you know, they're, they're gonna have to worry about engagement on some level but i think it's the risk is gone when it's basically free for for gamers to try and, and get hooked on what you're doing so i you know i don't know but that's my prediction yeah, I got another yeah, question I was... for you because I want to clear up. I, I just want to clear this up, and I want you to answer this as non PC as you can. Do developers care about people just simply playing their games? Now, when I say this, I know you want people to play your games, but you also want them to pay for it. Am I correct or am I wrong? Are you okay with people finding whatever way to play your game, even if it doesn't benefit you, the creator? Yeah, absolutely. Like I said earlier, you know, for me, the objective is making games and having people play them and experience them. And yes, it's a business. We all need to get paid. But, you know, if you're getting... If you can't afford Days Gone full price and you wait for a discount or if you get a secondhand copy or you play a friend's or you get it from Redbox, I don't care. I mean, those are all, I mean, that's the industry. That's the, that's the business. It always has been for, uh, for the most part. And um, no, it, it's all good. Assuming that, you know, um, at a certain point, the developers do need to be profitable. And as long as it doesn't or they're not going to be able to make another game. So as long as this doesn't get so rampant that it comes back and, and the developers have, you know, they have uh, 10 million, you know, players, but they've only sold 1 million discs, then, you know, that, that just doesn't hold up. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm <laughs> Definitely. I that. Should, I, listen, man, I still just, I, I can't, man, I just can't. I don't, under, I don't understand it, Jeff, man. I'm really trying to understand it. But if I make a game or if I make a if I make a song, I'm a I'm an artist. So I create music. If I create music, I want people to play that music. I want them to purchase that music. I uh, it, it's not just, oh, man, I just want you to hear me, bro. Just hear me and tell me what you think. Nah, I, I do want you to support it as well. Like, yeah, yeah, that's the dream. You know, that's that's obviously the ideal situation. But, you know, if you make it and it. it just look at it like some of these people were never a sale anyway. You know, they, you know, um, unless they could get it the way that they got it, um, they were never going to be able to appreciate it. And, you know, especially for a game like Days Gone, where uh, when people play it for a period of time, they become locked in, engaged, and they become huge advocates for it. So I think that there, you know, there's, you know, hell, I don't even care if you pirate it from the Epic Game Store. You know, I mean, it's just like, if you can pay for it, pay for it. If you absolutely can't, then, then uh, you know, find a way to play it and you know if you can afford it and then you pirate it and you want to play it then that's weird like, you know those are the people that should be paying us off so we can make the next one but um no man i think that um for for us more more eyeballs more people play more people invested is better for the community it's better for kind of getting this thing you know kind of a, a off the ground in the community and, and and having people appreciate what it really is they they become advocates to bring other people into play so yes the money is great but at the end of the day you know you, you make something so people can appreciate it and um now i'm not the bean counter at sony but is the is the is one of the developers you know i just love the fact that people played it they they tweet at me all the time and i never ask them how did you get this how much did you pay it's like great job i'm glad you enjoyed it so i guess i can never argue with a person about that anymore because you have solidified it you have said you just want people to play your game that's what they've been repeating and i'm like dude no way they don't just want you to play their game, but you're saying, yes, we just want you to play your game. Yeah, like, like I said, I want people who can pay for it and who are willing to pay for it to pay for it. But if, you, if you're borrowing it or what's secondhand, go to town. I mean, that's, that's the reality. Books have to do that. Movies go through that. Other games, it's, it's, a, it's a reality of our world. Okay, fair enough. Fair in enough. the streaming world, in the, in the streaming world, that would kind of end, though, right? But then that still wouldn't give a game to the developer just give a game to the to the service provider right like like because it wouldn't be about units no more so like like say you can't trade a, a a subscription service you know like if you got a game 
and you're playing a game, you can't just give it to somebody else who doesn't have that right. subscription yep. service. Like kind of like that. But then at the same time, it's not like you're losing or gaining units because you've already been paid off in a, in a way. Right. Yes. Or, yes. Or, you've got some built in, you've got some built in revenue just by whatever agreement you have with this, this company. And that's, right. uh, you know, I think, I think that, you know, I've, I've yet to actually be in that type of a business situation, but, you know, I think if a company is willing to give you a hundred million for the rights to your game, you know, uh, then you've got to figure out how to make it for 50 and then pocket the rest of that dough. That be, that becomes the game at that point. I hear that. I definitely hear that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, nah, man, I, I feel crazy about it, man, because I I, I I like to get sequels to stuff that, you know, that I like. And I feel like people should support the content. But, hey, if the people creating the content don't feel that way, then I who mean, am I? I mean, I'm the same <laughs> you know way, too. I mean? Like, Jeff, like, you know, all of us here, like, we, we normally just pre-order a game's day one and... You know, if you enjoy the game, we talk about it. If you want a sequel, like, you know, we would love to see that. But I just hate the shit that happened with Days Gone because it's really unfortunate. And um, Yeah, you know, it, it, it is. And like I said, you know, um, when I'm out here complaining that Days Gone didn't get a sequel, I know all I know all the facts and, you know, they go into it and, and for the most part. And, um, you know, we, we made a great game, but it, it, it did fail to kind of speak to a larger, more diverse audience than it did. And, you know, that's, those are unforced developer errors. And, uh, you know, it would have been, would have been great to get a sequel, but I, I, I get it. Um, if, if I was in charge of Sony and you said, what would you rather have the next Last of Us or the next Days Gone? I'd be like, well, oh, you know, Days Gone. But really, from a business point of view, Last of Us is just, you know, it makes so much more sense. And I think that that's it. I mean, we're, we're a lot like last of us and um you know that that's on us too although for the you know for the sequel my my hope was that we were actually going to kind of push it into a different space uh you know knowing that we wound up a lot like uh you know aesthetically like last of us i'm like okay well deacon's got this great kind of he's been injecting himself with this shit like we're kind of sci-fi a little bit crazy already and then we had that stuff with o'brien i'm like we can push towards a little bit more of the uh kind of sci-fi aspect of this and maybe uh push the world into you know like Whereas Last of Us was, you know, the world was becoming more and more decayed. Um, my future plans for this were to kind of make it like, no, this this is a society that can still be repaired. And that becomes part of the, the challenge that's going on. Uh, so, I don't know. At the end of the day, it you know, it makes sense why there isn't one. It is frustrating for, for me and for you know, a lot of the fans. But um, it's a business and there's a lot, it's a lot of money. It takes a lot of money to make games these days. Yeah, yeah, no, I definitely understand. So basically, um, well, I'm not going to say that, but uh, I was going to ask you a question now that I think about it. Um, with Siphon Filter, is there any correlation between Siphon Filter and um, Days Gone? And was that going to be kind of added towards the next game? Because I saw somebody make a video about it, and then he was showing the comparisons of the guys in the suit and everything like that. Yeah, so, you know, there, there's still a debate between Sean Garvin and myself about this. We did this on the Jaffe show, but... Um, it, you know, according to John, no, they're not the same, same universe. And according to me, they are. Uh, and, you know, because we did put these Easter eggs in the game just for fun. Um, but to me, it, it, you know, it, it, uh, those were both of our IPs. So, you know, like if we can't, if we can't somehow, you know, decide that they're the same universe, then nobody can. But uh, we do disagree on it. Uh, but I, I would say that I'm more right than John is because there is Siphon Filter in the Days Gone universe. Therefore, they're, they're the same universe. <laughs> Man, if I were you, I would have kicked his ass and been like, "No, nah, we're doing it this way." <laughs> he came. He came around. The site builder stuff was not popular uh, early on, but he came around to the idea. So you know, it's uh, sometimes you gotta you gotta keep at it. You gotta persuade people. But he bought into it. But the you know he's got he didn't buy into it as canon like I did. Gotcha. Well, I got a I got a question that uh, it's a little little off of this topic, but still on topic. Um. Is there a game or something like that that you've played in your younger years that made you want to get into gaming? Like, is there a game that stands out to you and still stands out to you to this day? You know, the, the one where I realized games could be so much more than they were was, um, and it's an obscure one, uh, Golgo 13 on, this, on the Nintendo Entertainment System. Was something oh, that, I, that name in a wow that was off of an uh, anime too, wasn't it? Yep, yep. And uh, yeah. I never heard of the anime, but I, a, a guy in my dorm was he had a, he had a NES and he was playing this. I'm like, at first, because you know, well, the reason why I really love this game is it was multi-genre. 
uh, back in a, in the time when most games just had one mode and that was it. This basically went through because you're playing the spy in in the Cold War, and he was a real badass. He could snipe people. He could fist fight. Uh, he could make love to women, which the game also let you do, which is great. And uh, it just really captured the vibe. So I think one of the, the opening missions was you were flying a heli your helicopter through the you know through the air towards the target, and you're you're shooting you know, other airplanes. You know, pretty conventional game style. But then you uh, you arrive at your target where you're going to assassinate somebody. And so you snipe from your helicopter. So you went from this great side-scroller helicopter game to a first-person sniper aim uh, game. And you know, then you were scuba diving, uh, doing more, you know, more side-scroller stuff. You were you're doing a, a walking through the street side-scroller, doing a kind of a melee a punch and shoot type game. Um, and then there was a first-person corridor crawl through these subways that, between spaces that you had to somehow you know navigate. And then at the end of the day, you'd be in your hotel room and these contacts, these theme, these, you know, these James Bond, beautiful women would appear in your hotel room. And they'd always have some sort of speech like, you know, you know, uh, I forget the name of the character, you know, this world is dangerous and we can never count. We, we never know if we have another day. Uh, so we really got to live in the, you know, the moments that we have. And then she steps up and kisses you and you see the silhouette in the window of the hotel and the light goes out. Like, this was all in the <laughs> eight, dude. <laughs> like, this was <laughs> This. And oh, when, when, you, when you came out of the hotel the next day, your health bar went, you know, just kind of filled back up and everything. And uh, it just made me feel like a fucking spy. And so it, I think that that was the first game that showed me that games can be so much more cinematic and immersive than they had been at that point. Oh, I get that. I mean, mine was uh, Metal Gear Solid. I mean, I never forget the right. scene um, with um, with Sniper Wolf when when Snake kills Sniper Wolf. You know, yep. I'm a I'm a kid looking at it. I'm like, ah, he's gonna save her. You know, something's gonna happen. Or and that that camera must have went up and he shot her. I'm like, wow. Like you know, <laughs> changed my thought. Like, hold on. Like, is this guy good or what is going on? So it really made me pay attention and um, it let me know also that you know, gaming can be deeper than um than what I thought it was. I mean, playing Mario, you just run around breaking bricks with your head, you know, and then you get to playing Metal Gear and you see a whole different, like, perspective. And then it was so political and it was just a movie. It's just insane. Um, no, I, um, I, I appreciate that one because I think a lot of people don't don't really get into the ask get to get to ask you guys these kind of questions, man, because I think it's more interesting that you guys actually became developers. And it's a lot of gamers who want to be developers. And you guys made that step. You know, it's a lot of gamers who want to be developers, but they ain't never took that step. Um, was there a time that you were intimidated um, on a game that was coming out and you were afraid of how it was going to work out or intimidated by the project itself? No, I can't think of anything that, that you know, on either side. What are you, what are you, what are you thinking? Like, 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 say, when Day's Gone. We could just use Day's Gone since we all know Day's Gone like that. Um, was there a time to where you felt intimidated by the idea since you went to from a to a bigger format, um, or where, was it just pure excitement and, and, and joy on knowing the challenge ahead? Of you? A little bit of both. I mean, with with Days Gone, like I, I had convinced the company to go with the open world, and uh, they they signed up for it. But then and then <laughs> there was a moment where we're like, okay, well, what does that mean? <laughs> and uh, you know, I think we all had our different take on it. But after, you know, a year of development, when we had a world up and running, we had pretty rudimentary motorcycle mechanics, I was driving through the world and I was actually kind of stressed out saying, what the fuck? What are we going to fill this with? What are we going to do in this world? You know, because it's, you know, we still believe in the idea, but like, how are we going to keep the player while driving from place to place? Like, how is this world going to be any different than any open, any other open world game? And, you know, that stress was was good stress because it forced me to go in and start kind of really analyzing what, you know, what the open world meant, what it meant for just you know, in general, what it meant for a zombie game, what it meant for a narrative. And uh, that, that forced me down a series of rabbit holes where I came back out with the, with the survival action uh, ambush model. Um, so there, before that kind of, before that idea really kind of coalesced, yeah, there was a lot of stress around like, I, I don't know if we have anything original here. Uh, and then once those thoughts did coalesce and, we, and they became the formal design, it just took, a long time for them to come to fruition because the game was so complicated and engineering was backed up. But uh, it it uh, it was stressful, uh, kind of waiting on that bet. It's like the it's like the roulette wheel that you spin, and it just keeps going for two years. You know, it, it gets stressful for sure. But then then it lands on your number and you're good. You want some money. Uh, 
that that's kind of what we went through for that. But that was pretty stressful. But I think we came out on the other side, right? Was a yeah. let me ask you a question. Um, this will be real quick, Thrash. I promise. What is your favorite console of all time? If you had Ooh. to choose, and it doesn't have to be PlayStation, because I know people just going to think, yo, he worked for PlayStation so clearly. No, what was your favorite platform of all time? Gosh, um, you know, I will say that it, this may not be that popular, but the Nintendo 64 at the time when it came out with those bizarre ass controllers, uh, which, <laughs> you know, they're crazy now, but it, it the, they were so... The games were designed one to one with those controllers, and they just felt really, really right. So, um, experiences I had playing Ocarina of Time, uh, playing you know like a three D Zelda was was crazy. Uh, you know, playing a three D Mario, which was brilliant with uh, their with their kind of room design, and you went back into the same world with different objectives each time. Um, so, I, w- I would say that uh, an old Golden Eye, uh, obviously on that, but I don't know if it's so much the hardware so much as the that was the hardware that was out when 3D started, when these 2D games were becoming 3D and still being emotional in some way. But um, I, have, I have a lot of fondness for the N64. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way when it comes to NES, man. I, I really, NES is where I really think gaming kind of opened itself up to me. Like, this is, this is definitely something I'm going to be doing for years. Yeah. Um, all of the different experiences that I had on there, like you're probably not familiar with a game called Guardian Legends, but that was one of my favorite NES games, along with like the Super Contra series, the Ninja Guidance and things like that. Uh, and Anticipation is one still one of my favorite games of all time. Um, but yeah, I think the way you feel about the N64 is the way I felt about the NES. And that's probably still one of my all time favorite systems with my all time favorite game, Super Mario Brothers 3. Oh, yeah. Greatest Mario yeah. ever created. Yep, yep. Greatest Mario. Yeah, no, 100% agree. Two was a nice kind of detour for that for that series, but it was you know, but uh, three really yeah brought it all together, and it was a, it was a pure Mario game, and having the overworld, it was it was amazing. The, the squirrel suit, uh, love that game as well. Yep, the, the squirrel suit is iconic, low key. Yeah, you know, really iconic. Um, what I was gonna say was um. Wait, hold on. Was it, was it a squirrel or was it a raccoon? Nah, it was it was called it was a squirrel. It was a flying squirrel. Oh, it was it's called it, it was literally called the the was it the Naki suit? Hold on. I thought it was a flying squirrel suit, but uh <laughs> I thought I thought it was a flying squirrel myself. Dude, I thought it was a raccoon. But he, got, the whole time, he my had spikes like a raccoon on the tail. Let's just let, let's just call it a mushroom thing. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> the, tanuki, the tanuki suit is what it's called. Tanuki mm. suit. Yeah, whatever that is. I don't know. I don't even know what that is. But <laughs> um, with this new generation, with PS Five, especially, I don't know how much you've worked on it. I'm pretty sure you've you've you, you know some things about it. I'm not asking for you to tell us anything that we don't know. Um, um, but just the de- the delivery, like like Mark Cerny said that uh, they cut out all the bottlenecks. Um. Well, as many bottom, we well basically all the bottlenecks. I don't know. I'm not a developer, but I'm just going by what I interpreted. He said, um, "Is it really that easy to do, to uh, to make games on the PS5 or for the PS5 at a high level?" Um, no, no. I mean, I don't. I don't no. think anything. Things might be easier, you know, for some. You know, certainly what he's talking about is going to impact the engineers more than it's going to you know than than, than I'm going to understand, but. Um. Um, no, I, I think that what it does is it, it still made, the level of difficulty is still quite high. I just think that you know what, what he might be talking about is there are some some kind of real real rough pain points or bottlenecks that uh, that they found ways around. But you know um, the complexity of software these days, you know, especially when you're running you know on on engines like Unreal, especially um, even if it's a homemade engine, it's just the, the games are so complex that they're they're challenging. What Cerny's talking about might alleviate some pain points. With okay. That, like, can you? Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Always cut me off, dark skin. My bad, nigga, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> one more, one more point. How did you get it? One more, one more thing I wanted to say. Um, um, the way that um the the SSD is um is is people are, are people are touting it. Um, you as a developer, if you were to utilize the SSD. What would it what what would it affect? Like I know loading times and all that, that's obvious. But 
attorney was saying that you can actually design games differently um, with the SSD. And I don't think we've seen that yet. Um, what way would you utilize it as a developer if you if you were to utilize it? Well, I don't know, if, you know, what Cerny, you know, exactly what, uh, you know, what he sees is the potential. Uh, he's a smart dude. He's going to see stuff none of us do. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the faster load times can be, you know, it, it, it really is just that. The, mm -hmm. you know, basically sometimes it, fast load times can actually be a problem, you know, because psychologically a fade for some moments, you know, indicate, you know, fade is, is may not be a technical requirement. But in movies, uh, when a, a, a scene fades to black and then it hangs on black for an extra second or two, they're doing that for a very specific effect. It's not frame rate. It's not you know, streaming. It's no nothing. So you know, I think that it can't just always be about faster loads, although that is going to be a, a boon to, to, to developers. Um, so I, I would say I don't know. But you could, do, you could do a lot of really being able to load a new space fast you could do a lot of kind of flashbacks in the same moment uh, instantaneously because that is you have to you know unloading and unloading that data does take a while. So I think that there's you know some storytelling techniques that that could be you know that could be leveraged with that. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the downsides, and you know this is just something I was exposed to, never had to deal with because I'm not working on you know I didn't work while I was at, at, at Bend, is mm -hmm. um, at a certain point that SSD like as fast as it is, you can't hammer it with uh, auto saves the way that we could the old. The, the old drives uh, because there's just something about when you write too frequently to this, it can wear it, it can, it can wear it out. So, you know, it, that could theoretically change the way that we do some auto saving in the background. Uh, we did a lot of auto saving in the background of days gone. So maybe, you know, maybe that wasn't a good candidate, but you can, you can still do it. You just can't be as aggressive as, as you once were, as I understand. Um, wow. Well, yeah, some information I didn't know. Go ahead, Sick. What, what was you going to say on well, I mean, as simply as you can put it for people who really don't understand, what are development kits and how are they useful? Oh, yeah. You know, so a dev kit is, is since the retail units are, are uh, kind of copyright protected, you know, they've got all kinds of protections and, and they're, they're, uh, they're missing. They're pretty lean units because they're trying to sell them at a price that people can afford at a large volume. But when you're developing, you can't just, you know, even if you could, uh, mod your your PlayStation Four or Five to take a burn disc and play it. it. It doesn't have a lot of memory, or it doesn't have a lot of kind of uh, communication tools to it, where it can talk back to to your PC. So really, that's what a dev kit is. Is it's something that it's it's something you use and you develop on, and it's got it can take debug uh, executables with a lot of extra memory requirements and overhead, and and play them back in in ways that um, you need to develop. And if you tried to do all that on a console. A retail unit, it it would just uh, it wouldn't work. It, it wouldn't have the memory to to run. It wouldn't it wouldn't even let you install it because it would say, hey, this isn't a disc or it's not a it's not a digital it's not a certified digital copy from the store. You can't run it on here. So they're just tools to kind of get you closer to the final target, but in a way that still allows you to be flexible as a developer. Gotcha. Okay, so let me ask you this question: With a development kit, could you develop a game? without the need of a PC just having a development kit? I, I don't think so. Uh, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, we use Unreal 4 for, for Days Gone, and we could, you know, you could test a lot of the stuff in the editor uh, on your PC, but really you had to then send it to the, to the hardware just so you could feel it in, on the true, you know, the hardware and, and to see how it would really play. Windows is bloated, you know, so it needs a lot of extra memory. The thing doesn't run at the same frame rate. It stutters when you're playing on the PC. So, um, the PC is just is one of the one of the critical links now because um, you're authoring the content there on the dev kit themselves. You can't author content, you know, unless you know maybe Dreams is doing something crazy. But no, in general, it's got to be built on something. And before we did work with Unreal, we would build stuff on the PC and then deploy it to the dev kit and run it there. Like we had no Windows version, of it. we you know, but the data was it was all the data was being authored. But we did not have a Windows executable that was the game, and I think that's true for most developers that are that are kind of working on just consoles. That's what I was wondering because I'm like, okay, so the information, so everything is started on in a PC environment, and then that information is then transferred to that dev kit, or you burn a CD that has that information on it. No, you're, trans you're transferring it. Yeah. You're, oh, you're so you're just transferring. Gotcha. Network. 
Yeah. Okay. Wait a minute. Gotcha. Hold on. It, Hold it, on a in the old days, we didn't have to burn disks and put them in. That was the only way to do it. But now we just deployed the pack, the uh, the install packages. Gotcha. Okay. Uh-huh. Just like kind of having, um, for sake of an argument, like a a, a modded system, so to speak. So you just have something where it connects maybe via server. But yeah, through you know through the ne- the, the network, it, it, you know it something like that. It just depends on your studio and the you know the hardware that you're using, the game you're trying to make. But yeah, it's you can't do any authoring on that hardware. It's just it's not you have to you have to create the environment somewhere else. You know, it's crazy because I've been looking at uh, how these companies are kind of acclimating to the fact that people are working from home. And they have these like platforms as a service where everybody can kind of work in the same space and edit stuff in real time. You know what I'm talking about? Like I was watching something with NVIDIA where they have their own little God, I forgot what they called it. But developers could literally uh, edit something from that particular uh, program or that, that platform that's in the cloud and it would take effect right away. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? Or yeah, am I yeah, no, that's, that's like right. some, some coded that's language right. at this point? <laughs> uh, I want to make sure I'm not getting it wrong because I that's what I took from it when I saw the demonstration of it. But AMD has something very similar to that as well. Gotcha. Sorry, uh, I, I got distracted. Did I did I answer the question or is it, is it still lingering? Well, no, 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 no. I was just asking if you knew uh, what I was speaking of, where you guys have this environment that you can work on, and it's generally in the cloud. Oh, and for, you can, for like, sure. Do full development directly through the cloud. Yeah, some studios do that, and it, it's a it's just a philosophical thing, you know. Whether it's in the cloud or if it's on the local network, but it's it's live as soon as you touch it. Like you know, um, we at Bend for years, we were always the iterate on the PC and then export something to play. The whole idea that you would just move something on your on your PC and then the game would would automatically update mm-hmm. is it's cool to do, but it also introduces a lot of kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, wor- workflow issues. Meaning, should everybody on the team when they're playing the game at the same time should they get your intermediate changes or not? Like you know, because typically what I do is I'll go through and I'll try ten different things and then I'll submit and then that's the one that you guys would get. Doing it live, teams are doing it. I've never been part of a team that has done it, but I have questions and concerns about it. No, no, that absolutely that answers it thoroughly for me. I, I wanted to know if it was a viable way to actually develop games, but I can definitely see where that can be uh, become problematic. And I think it. Right. But I think some, I think some developers they love it and they wouldn't do it anything else. So it just it comes down to your architecture, right. your team, the type of game you're making, and what workflows right. you know, do or don't work for you. Absolutely. All right. Um, let me let me back up a little bit because I think I got my questions out of the way once again. <laughs> no, I just I wanted to say question. I was going to ask oh. Tina actually. Um, you know, speak because they were speaking on the dev kits, and I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, you formerly being a PlayStation QA tester, actually, do you guys get dev kits as well, or how do you guys actually test these games out? Like, do they send you like some kind of copy via like play it on PC, or is it uh, on PlayStation, or how does it work? Um, dev kits. I, I don't think it's any secret that um, QA used dev kits. I'm pretty sure it's on the internet somewhere. <laughs> so um, you're yeah, safe. QA used dev- yeah, you're good. Yeah. <laughs> Still under NDA. Um, yeah, dev kits. That's what QA use. It's got all the information that we need to give developers. Um, so when working on Days Gone, for example, if Jeff needed like I don't know a frame rate start, for example, something really basic, I could use the dev kit to find it and then send it to Jeff in a, in a bug report. Um, and then he could replicate it on his kit as well. Um, there was like, you know, you could change the memory size and stuff like that. And sometimes yep. it would affect how a build would run. Um, so yeah, it's just a, a handy way to get to the developers and let them replicate what we're actually doing on our side. So, yeah. Gotcha. Now go ahead with your question. Sorry about cutting you off. <laughs> it's all right. Um, oops. I was just thinking, um, it's quite a big year for games this year. Um, I was looking at the list of games that were coming out like a few days ago. I was going to ask, what is your most anticipated game for this year? Oh, it good question. So, be, it doesn't have to be AAA. It can be indie. It can be anything. <laughs> no, no. I think I've got my eyes just on two AAAs at this point. Uh, or three, yeah. 
So uh, Dying Light to obviously, that's right in my wheelhouse. Totally looking forward to trying that. It sounds huge, so that's kind of intimidating. I don't know if I'm going to finish it. Um, so that one, you know, Horizon. Uh, really love the first one, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, they're a good group of people, and they took, uh, you know, the, I'm expecting something epic out of that. Uh, and then further down the road, you know, uh, Starfield. To me, I just think I'm, I'm super intrigued by that. I, you know, there's a lot of really interesting games that have been announced. It's like, a, you know, like, it seems like there's a lot of vampire games coming out. Like, those seem kind of intriguing. But um, those, those three that I mentioned are, are probably the big ones that, I'm, that are in my head right now. Starfield is definitely on my radar as well. Um, you just mentioned vampire games, actually. My boyfriend's sitting next to me. He's going to be laughing about this. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever played Vampire Survivors on Steam, but that's all my friends are playing right now. I'll take a look. <laughs> it's Honestly, my friends list on Steam is just Vampire Survivors. And that's it. <laughs> so... I'll definitely look into it. I'll see what it's about. <laughs> yeah, hey. It's pretty cool. Jeff, you're not excited for Elden Ring? So I am not into super hardcore uh, <laughs> games. So I'm I'm intrigued by all the buzz around it. I, I've yet to determine if that's for me. Like, you know, Returnal? I fucking love Returnal. I'm never going to finish it. I'm never even going to come close. Just because... God, I was it, just going to ask you that too. Jesus. Yeah, what, what, what they're great. asking of me, I, you know, if I were... You know, way back when I was a kid in high school and I had a whole summer off and I had, like, no money... You know, if I and I had like one game, I would totally finish Returnal. <laughs> but uh, it just, it, it's one of those games where it, it, I, it I think it's brilliant, but it, it asks a lot. And I wouldn't want them to change it, you know, because that would destroy what the game is. But um, yeah, it, I'm, I'm fascinated by that game. I'm, I'm, I'm really, I, I just kind of obsess over it all the time, but I just know that I'm never going to finish it. And I got I to gotta kind of deal with it. And so that's why a lot of the From games don't appeal to me. Uh, you know, definitely with, a faster hard drive, maybe I'd, I'd give them a go because all the restarts would be that much quicker. But um, yeah, no, they're rough. And, and I beat Hotline Miami one, and I got most of the way through Hotline Miami two. And th- you know, those games they were they were really brutal and unforgiving. Oh, but you yeah. were back, you were back instantly. You know, and, and to me that kind of made up for it. And these other games are getting better, but um, yeah, I just I just have too many games in my backlog. I'm getting too old, and uh, you know, I, I I know my limitations. And you're still young. Stop right. playing. Oh, I Line Miami is absolutely freaking awesome, man. Everything from the soundtrack to just the oh, game totally. itself is totally the, uh, freaking amazing. Yeah, man. the masks to me, I thought were brilliant, just because you know, <laughs> you, you know, they, they they had properties attached to them and they looked really cool. I mean, it just had right. so much attitude and style. It was awesome. Was Does it was it, it just of... one guy who made that game? Is it is that one of the Ball games? Or... Is, Devolver Digital published it. I don't. I couldn't tell you who made it. Yeah, I couldn't either. Oh, I'm thinking the wrong game. I'm sorry. I'm thinking of something else. Miami. You thinking Hotline Miami is the? Uh, I'm tripping. I know what game you're talking about. No, I don't think one person made that. That's the same I, game that uh, old, old girl was playing. The Last of Us uh, Two, when yeah, she got yeah, killed. Yeah, I think I think they're huge fans of too, and it, it, that's what the girl was playing on her on her PSP, which PSP. is why I played it. Yeah, yeah, I, that's I, how I played it. Hotline Miami is just a wonderful game. You know what it kind of reminds me of just a little bit? I don't know if you're familiar with this game, but it was a game that came out on the Sega Genesis called Kid Chameleon. I've heard of that. Kid Chameleon. I've heard of that. Only because of how the the, the mask kind of changed how the character performs. That's probably the only relation uh, to the Mm -hmm. game whatsoever. But... That's the first game that comes to mind when I think of uh, Hotline Miami. But then again, Hotline Miami is like one of those super fast paced, go through this door, hope you don't get shot by this random bullet. You got <laughs> yeah. three people in there waiting for you. You got to kill them all before they can figure out who you are. That, yeah. that, that's that, that's what Hotline Miami is. But I really love it, though. I, I, I really love that freaking game. And it's, it's amazing when I'm listening to y'all talking about this and then I'm thinking about the games that uh, Jeff is talking about. The only one I think I may have to ask both of y'all. Uh, <laughs> I, I got to ask both of y'all. What in the world is Starfield? <laughs> That's what I was going to ask, too, actually. I'm sorry. I, I got to keep it a buck. I have no I know, idea question? what that game is, what it's about. I- and I just don't even understand where the hype from it comes from. But then so again, I, I'm not like a big like uh, Fallout or Elder Scrolls fan either. So I guess that so, might be something. 
for, for me, I don't know a lot about it, but the promise of it is kind of implied by Bethesda's history, right? And what, what they do is it's a, if we're just talking about Skyrim in space, you know, I'm like, okay, that's cool. That speaks to me a little bit better than, you know, the old fantasy stuff. And um, I, I think that their games are just deep and fun in ways that you get to customize and tailor your experience. So I'm really hoping it's that. I'm, you know, with, um, with all of the, the No Man's Sky's brilliant game. But it's, you know, and I haven't played it since the, the first year it came out. I know they've done a ton of updates that are great. So I don't know if they've addressed this. But um, when you're going through looking at all these really cool procedurally generated worlds and, you know, you may be the only person on this planet ever, um, it, it was a great procedural system. It wasn't a great kind of emotional system. You know, you didn't get a chance to interact with other NPCs or kind of, you know, say, hey, I'm going to go to that, you know, we're going to this planet or not going to that planet could change the state of something else somewhere. So I, I think that that's to me, what Bethesda is going to be offering with Starfield. And um, I could be wrong, but, you know, as a, as, as a consumer, that's kind of where my, my mind went to right away when they revealed what they did. Gotcha. Okay. Oh, man. It's basically a, a space <laughs> RPG in short. <laughs> Pretty much. Well said. <laughs> yeah. It looks it look nice. Um, just have to wait and say there's, there's not too much information about it, I think, so... But I guess I, nice, I guess I understand what um I understand what Sick Humor is talking about because like you know all we've seen was like what uh was it like just some cinematics? No, it wasn't even cinematics. It was just a little trailer and stuff like that. But we have no idea what the game is actually going to be. You know, what right. if it turns out to be like some side scroller or something, or like a puzzle nah, game. I don't, you know, I don't, I know. Yeah. but, but you yeah. get what I'm saying this though. Developer, this is where the developer brand it kind of really it packs a punch, and you you know like all right, I don't care. honestly I don't care what it is. I know that it's going to be interesting as hell. And that's what I'm looking for. So, yeah, I, I, I of, like the... Oh, my bad. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. See. No, 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 no. I'm not going to do it. Man. Get it out because I'm talking about switching gears to a totally different <laughs> topic altogether. So I don't want to oh, leave yeah. this. Yeah. Just go yeah, ahead. Um, 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 I think the, the, the problem that I have with Starfield is that, yeah, it's good to be mysterious. But you gotta give us a better like like Kojima's a genius at it. When he did Death Stranding, even before the game came out, people really didn't know what the hell was going on. And that was the beauty of it. Every trailer added to the mystery. It answered some questions and, and then it made a lot more questions. It made a lot of analysis videos on it. And it's just you just didn't know what was going on because it was just so crazy, but it was just ultra interesting. But he did it with gameplay and did it with everything too. I think that's the problem with Starfield coming out this year. It's insane that we don't know really anything. And I mean, it, it's good to be mysterious um, and all that. But I think that the, the, the way they are promoting it should have been better. Should have been, if you're going to be mysterious and be mysterious with your gameplay, be mysterious with your trailer and design your trailer in a way to where you're not giving away too much, but you're giving away, what it is kind of to where there's a different kind of hype behind it. And I don't know. Do you think games should be more like, well, well not games, but uh, trailers and marketing and all that. And the way they do this stuff should be more like Kojima to where you're showing the game, but you're not giving away the game. You know, um, I'm not going to ever argue with a Beth with what Bethesda is doing. Cause they do a lot of shit, right. You know, the, mm -hmm. better than most of us. And so uh, I, I couldn't take issue with that, but there is a certain risk of overexposure too early. And, you know, I speak from experience with Days Gone, and I think that Stranding announced the same time we did. And, um, you know, at, the, at that time, we didn't expect that it was three years out. We expected that it was maybe a year and a half or two years out. So uh, you don't want to overexpose yourself and your message too early and or, or even, even uh, just run the risk of people being interested in two, you know, 2016, but they forgot all about you by 2019. So... Um, I think that marketing teams are really smart and savvy about this, and and they they know that hey, this is Bethesda. We don't have to say a lot more to generate interest. Same thing that Kojima had was, hey, look, this is my next thing. You know, Metal Gear. You know a little bit about this, but just you're really going to play because I'm Kojima, not because Death Stranding speaks to you. You know, I think that, that that carries a big punch. So every product is a little bit different, and they have to navigate uh, overexposure, underexposure, and timing and all that. So we'll we'll see more. Uh, you know, I think a concentrated publicity window is better for developers so people can become less jaded about you. If they've been hearing about how awesome you're going to be for three years, you're raising the expectations in a way that you can't possibly live up to. 
I see. Yeah. I see that. That's true. That is. You know, cool. um, I was just thinking. So when the tra- one of the trailers came out, uh, I think it was live streamed actually. I was sat in the office and we were all sat around the screen and there was just handprints on. It was a Death Stranding, um, live gameplay trailer. I think it was. And there was just handprints all over the, the stream. And we were all sat there like, what's going on? Yeah, <laughs> I remember the that. Amount, the amount of people watching the stream. <laughs> and it was just, you you couldn't see half of it. It was just covered in the handprints. I, I thought that was like pretty crazy, but pretty genius at the same time. Because the amount of people watching that stream, I mean, Fortnite did it as well. They had players watching a black hole for three days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean yeah. Kojima, <laughs> Kojima, that guy's a he's a unique, people pretty guy, man. That. Very cryptic, man. That's just how he is. Yeah. He's he's, <laughs> he's one of the few people that can do that and get away with it. I have to ask you, <laughs> Jeff Ross, man. I have to ask you this. And if you can't say that, that's perfectly fine. But what the hell is Blue Box? Like, what the hell is going on with this Blue <laughs> Box game situation? Do you? Th- when I read what they were saying, they were talking about something about the team being AI. Like, and, and the, the AI is building the game. I'm like, what the? And it's crazy because the only person we've ever seen out of Blue Box is that, what what is his name? Carmen? Some, something. Hassan. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. So my question to you is, what do you feel about this blue box situation and who the hell is green lighting this at Sony? I, I have no idea. I, I barely followed that when it came out because it sounded very ridiculous. So I, I don't have a good answer for you. But I do think that whoever, whomever that is, they're a genius at marketing. Uh, you know, uh, that's all I have. I don't think it's Kojima. I don't think it has anything to do with, with that. But I don't really know. I said the same thing, but the way people found correlations or found ways to connect that dude to Kojima, like they were like, hey, if you look at his name, his name means Kojima in some other language. I'm like, dude, what the f- what are we doing here, man? <laughs> and, I, and, think, and, I think it's the Moby, the Moby Dick uh, Studios thing that uh, that really is pushing it forward, I guess. I'm not sure. But how can how can how can this be good for them is what I'm trying to figure out, because, again, every time they they lose this acceleration on this marketing and shit, it's like they put their foot on the gas with saying something that sounds totally fucking unbelievable and they bring it all the way back up like they literally teased, uh you know, whatever game they're working on. um What was it called? Abandoned. They they tease that as if it was Silent Hill. Like they're mm. doing this to themselves. Like it's not like a, a de- like a developer that's just being bombarded with harassment from random people, you know, for doing nothing. Like they're literally feeding the fire. How <laughs> could that be good, Jeff? Like I'm trying to figure out how can this ever turn out to be good, dude. You know, uh, I I don't know. I think that you know they're generating some. They're gen- they they generated attention that they may not otherwise have, and with that attention, it's going to come expectations. And you know it. So it will bring a massive audience towards something that was just going to not stand out in any other way. But when you bring that audience, you're bringing uh, anticipation that you know they have they have different expectations than you may be delivering on. So I think that that's where a vague message can kill you. Mm. I've got a little something to add to that. By the way, hey, hey guys, I'm really sorry I'm so late. I uh, I was asleep uh, after an exhausting uh, couple of days. Nah, and man. we're gonna have to kick your ass after the show. <laughs> uh, shout out to the fellow Brit on the panel, uh, you, fellow UK. I'm detecting a uh, Liverpoolian accent. Oh, no. <laughs> I feel uh, chilled. Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa! Did uh, you really? You can really detect that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. Shout out to you. Um, and hey, so shout I, heard out to you. I heard a joke years ago that uh, <laughs> it's, not, it's not inappropriate, but it's not super appropriate. Is the British are super racist about their own accents. 
<laughs> That's hilarious. Well, I hate my accent. I'm guessing. I'm guessing. Uh, Tina hates her accent, but everybody else will love her accent. It's just the way it goes. Yeah. Every um, time I'm on a podcast or something, it's oh, you're from Liverpool. I love that accent. Oh, that's great. Well, it's an like awesome it. accent, <laughs> Tina. It is an. Oh, it, it's actually. It was ro- voted the number one friendliest accent in the UK. Uh, a while back so there you go um shout out to jake rocket uh ross jeff uh huge fan bro um really really yeah you're awesome uh thank you for for letting me be here gaming despair really appreciate it my brother um so i have a little bit of info on on this situation and the best way i can describe it is a beautiful accident um and it's an accident because well, f- firstly, I'm I'm actually in a group chat with Hassan Karaman um, on on PlayStation. Um, I'm doing a few things with him where I'm getting to see a few bits and bobs early. Um, and it, uh, by the way, his name doesn't translate Kojima; it translates Hideo uh, in his language. But but I mean, there are a lot of. Uh, co- co- there is a huge amount of coincidences, but the, the the hype, the advertising, it was more on people, people uh, spotting these coincidences than on him. It, it wasn't really uh, Hassan that Hassan didn't even advertise it as Silent Hill. That's kind of a a bit of a conflation. He he actually advertised it as survival. It begins with S, ends in L. Can you guess what it is? There was blanks in the middle. And he genuinely meant survival. So in a way, and because Hideo Kojima at the time was hinting at Silent Hill an awful lot and still is to this day, the timing kind of worked against him and everybody just jumped to the conclusion and suddenly started comparing the two. And, you know, he, he... I know for a fact that Hassan is a real person. I know that he's regretful of the way that the, all the coincidences have worked against him. And no matter what he says, people will just say in response, yeah, sure, Kojima. Yeah, sure, Hideo. Um, and and they'll just continue to insist that he is um, what, who he says he's not. And he has in multiple interviews stress that he's he's really is not Hideo Kojima he has no affiliation with him but people just will not accept that and so we can't blame put all the blame on him when there is a huge amount of conspiracies just and a huge and I was one of them I was one of them for like six months I was like holy like what is this the holy shit this is this has got to be Hideo Kojima I mean for goodness sake his trophy count was the same as the number on the YouTube commercial, the YouTube commercials number, which just so happened to be Sil- um, Silent Hill 4 uh, advertisement. And and it was just like, th- there was just so much, so, so many things tying him to Hideo Kojima. Wooly. It was it was hilarious. Wooly, fuck us up. We talking to Jeff Ross right now. <laughs> Ask yeah. this man some questions, please. <laughs> Nigga, we don't care about no. We don't even know. Hey, who no, 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 no. Hey, no, but it's interesting you bring that up because I remember. I just wanted to say because you, you yeah, brought it, it up. Is. Just, I just wanted to say. I just wanted to say. <laughs> I just wanted to say. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, it, it was a, it was a real, si- a real weird situation when it came to um, Hassan and what he was because literally he was bringing that heat on himself. We can't blame that on anybody. Uh, the game that we're working on starts with an S and ends with an L. Really? Yeah, survival, bro. That's what he said. But it is what it is. It can, you know. Oh, man. Uh, Jeff, what do you think about the uh, Microsoft Activision acquisition? Man, I am blown away by it. Uh, as a Game Pass subscriber, I think it's awesome. As a PlayStation fan, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got questions about you know, what that's going to mean for them moving forward. But um, I don't know. You know, I think that the, in a way, that you got a bunch of developers who maybe just had a lot of heat taken off of them to kind of come back and, and have a yearly franchise installment for, for Call of Duty. Um, you know, Microsoft's got the pockets to actually, where, whereas Activision was really kind of focusing on high-yield uh, games. You know, they weren't making any Guitar Heroes or Spyro. I mean, there's a huge library of, of IP that we could actually start to see cl- some classic games start to get made because they're going to be funded 
uh, you know, by Microsoft merely for, for Game Pass and no other reason. So um, I, I think it's good because that's where the industry is going, trying to, trying to do a Netflix of games. So Microsoft has the money to try and put this together. And what it means for Sony, I, you know, I think that Sony's looking good, but they, uh, and I say this without knowing shit about it, but my prediction just as a, as a fanboy is, Sony might just be making games in 10 years. You know, they may not be making hardware. They, you know, if, um, if the Call of Duty uh, franchise is enough to really kind of sway the audience towards, uh, you know, away from this 50-50 split or 55-45 split they have, I think that um, that's what it will mean for Sony moving forward. And that might not be a bad thing, uh, you know, because so they they've, they've got a lot of the great IPs, but they, they don't have enough developers to release a version of those IPs every year, you know? So I think that, um, you know, basically they, they may not be able to, su to sustain a software, uh, you know, a, a base library of, of kind of must-have titles, you know, for, for the PS5 or the PS6 later on because uh, Microsoft owns everything now. So it, I don't know, I'm, I'm excited and kind of, you know, terrified at the same time. Okay. Um... I guess my only question to that would be, uh, what gives you so much confidence about what Microsoft would potentially do? That's, oh, that's, my, that's my number one question. The only reason why I ask you that, because I do want to give you some background on why I'm asking you this question. Um, they, have, they, they own Rare. And Rare has a huge back catalog of IPs that they've done absolutely fuck all with. So. What makes you think because they bought Activision that they what makes you confident that they will then bring back all of these old IPs? So it literally comes down to they're going to have this install base of, of users. You know, I don't know what they're up to now at this point, but let's just say that they've got 100 million subscribers worldwide that are paying them their I don't even look at what it costs me every month, but uh, they're 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 paying them a shit ton of money and they, they need new titles every month. That is going to force Microsoft into going and buying a lot more library, you know, you know finding a way to, to drudge up old titles and bring them to the platform, or finding developers that can start to make these smaller, cheaper titles for the, for the platform. You go on Netflix, it's not all Ozark. You know, there, there are plenty of kind of shitty documentaries they bought from the Discovery Network for a while just to put more hours of content in the system. I think Microsoft right. will, they will run into that at a certain point, and they can't, you know, not every game can be equal in terms of budget or whatever, but you know, you can, you could fund a, a cheap crash bandicoot game that would, that would check all the boxes and appeal to all the fans. Yeah. I was, I was thinking that that's what I was saying earlier. Like, will these, will these subscription services become to the point where we lose, we lose quality in games because of stuff like this to where now you're forced to bring out games faster than what a developer would normally do, which would force you to make a smaller game, not to mention all the budgets and stuff like that. Um, that's basically the future is that, I mean, the, the power of the console ain't going to matter no more because they're going to be too busy trying to, uh, bolster these, these services. And it's going to be bolstered with games that are double A or even a game. Yeah. I, but, I, I, but like I said earlier, I think that that could lead to a really kind of a creative, like a watershed moment where, um, the, the same pressures that we have right now, the same market forces don't apply the same way. And, um, games can be riskier. So, Will it, will we wind up playing a couple two hour games that are one and done? Uh, hell yeah, I think that's that could be a good thing. You know, Gone Home was a brilliant game when it came out on the PC years ago, and it was very simple and probably very cheap to make, and it was still an incredibly satisfying experience for me as a gamer and, and a lot of other people. So um, I don't see that as a negative. I, I think that if if uh, if it becomes shovelware, like let's just get let's just let's build an emulator to get this old game up as it was. That's not very interesting, but if if it's shorter, kind of sweeter experiences, I'm down with that. It, assuming that there's always going to be the blockbusters too. Jeff, I, I it's have a lot a of assuming. <laughs> I have a question for you, Jeff. Uh, you mentioned you think Sony are going to uh, potentially. I mean, if if the Xbox acquisition of Activision and Call of Duty eventually in three or four years' time becoming a uh, Xbox exclusive has any sway over the casual audience um, to buying just Xboxes um, that Sony might just resort to just publishing games and not anymore making consoles, right? 
But we're seeing, we are seeing, you mentioned they, they just won't have the man, manpower to keep putting out games, but we are seeing them hiring an awful lot. Like, um, I mean, with Deviation, they've just expanded. Uh, uh, fire, fire Sprite uh, uh, are growing, are continuing to take on new new people. They're, they're continuing to make new partnerships. Um, I mean, do you think... Sony's um, aggressive approach towards third-party uh, partnerships. When you look at like Firewalk, Deviation, and Haven, and and then all the developers in the East, they have shares with Netties and Tencent as well. Uh, in fell, they have similar interests with those guys because they invest in the same developers in the East. Do you think um, that kind of success at nurturing and fostering kind of um, projects with third party developers might might save them from from that and that there could be net there could well maybe like a call a, a call of duty replacement within four or five years time and they have all that notice now by this recent move from microsoft all that advanced notice because it takes a lot of time they have contractual obligations etc to uh, honor um to create their own call of duty so to speak and that one game won't be enough to take people away from PlayStation as a console. What's your thoughts? You know, uh, definitely we're going to see this all play out in five plus years, right? Because you're right. There are a lot of contracts in place now that kind of guarantee some games are going to be out. But, um, you know, Microsoft, there, there's this great thing in tech where, you, you know, they, you know, they'll spend so much money uh, building an infrastructure. Like, you know, like look at anything Google does. Um, and they just did this with their domains, you know, like they gave this stuff away for free for years, but now once they've cornered the market and, and kind of elbowed everybody out, now they're charging people for it. So, um, you know, it's a business and Microsoft has deep pockets and, you know, the reason for them to acquire, spend so much money to acquire this is very complicated because it can lead to their overall, you know, market capitalization, but there's also owning this market moving forward. And one, and one of the things that um, I think that we're all seeing, uh, you know, in our daily lives with anything that we buy is anything we buy digital is companies want to sign you up for a subscription. You know, the software that I was using five years ago that was one, you, know, you purchase it once you're done is now a subscription model where I got it, you know, even apps on the app store, I got to spend six bucks a year on something. And um, it's in, in business, you know, if you're AT&T or Verizon, you got a, you've got a user on the hook with a year contract, they're going to pay you a hundred bucks a month. That is guaranteed money. And corporations love that. So that's what Game Pass is going to be. It's going to be a fixed source of income for Microsoft every month that they can count on. And um, it's, they're, they're, not, they're not entering those waters lightly. They understand that there's, you know, there's Netflix and then there's everybody else. You know, Disney Plus is making a pretty good run of things or you know, Hulu, I don't have real numbers, but there's, there's the big dog and, and they make a tremendous amount of money. And, and that's the business model everybody is chasing these days. And Microsoft just, you know, they basically, I, I, I think, almost entered a checkmate situation uh, on, on other um, game publishers, hardware manufacturers. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I really don't, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I think y'all giving them more credit than they really deserve in that aspect because I agree. If you look at, <laughs> I just, if you look at Nintendo, Nintendo sells more pl consoles and I think they're an outlier. Can push yeah. They're an outlier. They're they're bulletproof. You know, they've got the the beautiful thing about Nintendo is they built their audience when their audience were just kids, and the audience is loyal. So they're they're the outlier. They're the special case. Never bet against Nintendo. I think you underestimate Sony, though. I think you really are underestimating them, and it's crazy because you work for them, so you yeah, gotta and, know and the I, inner I, mechanism. I and I don't mean I'm not trying to make it sound like it. You know, that, a that I really know what I'm talking about here. But just just looking at it, and it, I think that the you know there's some things we can look at to kind of give us an indication of how our things are going to go, and that will be um, the chip shortage has kind of kept the 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 next gen console war even. You know, I'm not quite sure if Sony would have had a larger advantage by this point uh, if they if they had, were able to produce more, more consoles. But um, I I think that gamers don't have as much money as people think they do. When we you know some of the the, the data that I had at Sony was. Gamers will spend, they'll, bu they'll buy three titles a year because uh, that's all they can, most people can't afford to buy a shit ton of games. So they're going to have the, two of those games are going to be pre-spent in their mind. They're going to buy their, you know, their Call of Duty that they buy every year, uh, one other game that they're you know, developer they're partial to, 
or type of game. And then they're going to have the one where they're like, look, is it going to be Death Stranding or is it going to be Days Gone? Or maybe I'll do this. So they are, um, gamers are broke. <laughs> you know, there's the whales who go through and spend a lot of stuff on, on DLC or, or in, in game purchases. But, um, that, that's where I think that um, Game Pass can really speak to a lot of people. Uh, just it may not necessarily be their preference to go with that with that company, but they're going to get the best value for their buck every month um, for for uh, being with them. And, and it's because um, if you ask me, Sony's way better, right? Like you know, it is it's the PlayStation. The Xbox is just trying to imitate it, but the way that things that these business deals have have kind of shaken out, they. Microsoft just acquired some of the biggest dogs on the planet, and they are uh, they're going to start wielding those as a as a business weapon in in the next five to ten years. I mean, you know, the only thing with PlayStation is that they don't have a day and date uh, service like you know uh, Game Pass does. But you know, sometimes I look at the numbers and stuff like that, and I'm thinking, you know what, PlayStation Plus combined with PS Now, I think that's a better value because you get what like 800 games on the service plus 200 downloadables. I mean, isn't that a better service, you know, than paying 180 yearly for like Game Pass, especially when you don't have what is it, like 100 plus games? Mm-hmm. Nah, they got yes, they got but, like when, but when games. all of a sudden the best, you know, like just look how many copies Skyrim sold on a, on a variety of platforms. So you know, a million in total. It, yeah, but it's something where um, there's going to be there's games, and then there's like popular fun games that really build audiences and it, you know those audiences are going to want to play skyrim the next one that comes out uh, or the next elder scrolls that, that comes out that's like that and if that's only in one on one platform it you know you're obviously going to start pulling people towards that and away from another unless they're multi-platform like some of us you know you could, you was... could make the same argument for god of war though right i mean <laughs> it, it, it does work both ways and i genuinely think that you know the PS Plus is at fifty, almost fifty million subscribers. It's it's not even half the price of Game Pass, and it, it amounts to about four pound a month if you get the annual uh, package for me. And um, like it, it offers, it, it doesn't sacrifice kind of the whole uh, business model of sales. Um, I mean, I, I feel like this move from Microsoft has more. But turned a lot of develop, put a lot of attention on them, and not necessarily in a good way. I think that the aggressive kind of purchase of the industry um, or tr- attempt to purchase the industry um, shows se- several things. It shows what they intend to do, but it, I mean, it also at the same time, it it's all for kind of grabbing this cash cow. And it's money that Microsoft doesn't even need. They're a multi-trillion dollar company. And what does Activision make in a year at most? $10 million? Um, The question is, though, do you, do you really think that people who are in, into the PlayStation ecosystem will really just, like, scrap all of that for, just for Call of Duty? Um, no, no, no. But I think that, you know, losing, uh, losing something like Call of Duty that is... Let's just assume that it can stay popular, for one thing, right? That, that's not always a given... But if it stays, and it's on the wane right now too. But if it, if it, if it stays as popular amongst the multitude of gamers that it is right now, then if it's no longer available on PlayStation, that is going that could trigger the exodus of people to this. You know, it could it could factor it. Not even an exodus, but n- new console developer uh, purchasers will say, "Oh, what am I going to get? Well, my friends are playing Call of Duty. I can only do it here." So it's it, you know, it may not be a, a deliberate choice. It's just going to be people making. Uh, you know, the, the, the final decision based on a number of factors that, that kind of go to their lifestyle, you know, who, what their friends are playing. And, you know, it, it's, um, you know, you know, a black hole, it, it, you know, basically mass is attracted. The larger you get, the more mass you have, the more mass you're going to attract. At a certain point, you know, Microsoft could, and I'm not saying they will, but they could hit that critical mass where no matter what any other game publisher or a hardware manufacturer does is, they just can't compete because it's, the rich keep getting richer and more powerful because their ecosystem is big. People go with the popular thing. Doesn't mean it's the best thing. It just means it's the it's the thing that everybody else is doing, and and that's what could spell um, kind of doom for Sony. But uh, if you ask me, I'm pulling for Sony. I'm I'm very fond of them. I think that they've got the best IP around. Mm-hmm. But um, they may get into a point where, and, and they have the best hardware around, by the way. But at, at a certain point, they might start to to think, you know, uh, we don't make any money on this hardware. We make royalties on obviously the licensing. But um, 
look at all this money we're making on uh, God of War. Uh, you know, what, why don't we just focus on making God of War, you know, more of these, more, more horizons uh, and, and creating new IP. So I think that, I think that Sony has kind of identified IP as the true value moving forward. And you know, if they get a chance to, you know, it, you know, maybe out of necessity, they're forced to forced into fostering that versus kind of what they're doing right now, which is they're kind of fostering it alongside development of this hardware. Um, but I don't think Sony's going anywhere. It just they may not be the they may not be the winner in the in the you know each console's generation like they like they were on the four and on the two and the one. You know, I got a question actually. Now thinking about all that right now, um, and I've been thinking about it, talking about it with some friends. Do you think that Microsoft is possibly trying to become a third party publisher you know like not necessarily like they're getting ready to get out of the the, the console space and stuff like that and just you know be a subscription service well i think that the subscription service is tied to you know it actually it doesn't have to be tied to the hardware because it works on the pc too but i think that um like we talked about earlier not all of us are pc gamers like there's nothing better than you know like how, like i hate fucking with my you know pc trying to configure something to make it run a console that just works the way it works is 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 great. So, um, I don't know. Like, I don't see them in third party developing. I I, I think you got to start looking at it. Like, Netflix signs agreements with other production houses to make something for a certain amount of money. And you know, I guess that's technically third party publishing, but it's really, um, you know, you're you're paying somebody to to author content for your system to provide value to your install base. Okay. Yeah, I, I had a I had a deeper thought on that because. I already um, view them as a full hey, hold 100%. On. Hey, hey, Thresh, hold on one sec. Um, just give them the last question that you're going to have, and then uh, after that, I'm going to end the show, right? Just uh, go ahead, Thresh. All right, bet. Um, I was looking at the same thing. Um, <clears throat> my my view of it is this. Um, my I, I view Microsoft as already being a 100% third party. Like, they, at the end of the day, 100% of their games that they make are going to Steam, and Steam is a, is a platform that they do do not own and take royalties or give royalties to. And that's what third party companies do, right? That's just what they are. Um, I see them pushing game pass more than they push their, 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 their console. Even with this, this Activision purchase, they didn't really mention Xbox. They mentioned game pass. Yep. Um, so, so pushing towards the Netflix of gaming. Yeah, I get, but there's no Netflix doesn't own a hardware. Um, and I'm looking at it like the way Call of Duty makes money, the, the companies that they are buying are forcing them to go like the, the Sega way because these games won't have the same value that they have after purchase. If you purchase them and then you take them, you, you remove them from the, the, the platform that has a majority of its buyers, its fans, just to try to get them on a, on a console that has already failed you. There's a bigger risk than just keeping the game where it is and still collecting that money at seventy dollars a pop and selling uh, the best on all of the platforms. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's I think it would be backwards. You can still put Call of Duty on Game Pass if that's what you want to do, but then you're still losing money because even on Xbox with Game Pass, there it's still its number one seller and number one played game at seventy dollars. So if you're going to remove that, you're going to remove over half of your players from PlayStation, and then you're going to remove um, it from the $70 money that you were getting on Xbox to put it on Game Pass to sell Game Pass. The install base, the install base of Xbox is already the lowest install base in all of gaming, and you're not really going to gain much there. So if you're going to have to do it on PC as well to get that install base, and then there's a Call of Duty on cell phones that you can do as well. But then you would put all your eggs in one Game Pass basket instead of having it to where it is, to where you can have both Game Pass and it on all platforms and make a lot more money than you would if you were to take it all away just to put it in Game Pass to sell Game Pass. Am I am I wrong on that on that point of view of like it just doesn't make sense to take a third party game kind of like Minecraft. They didn't take Minecraft away from PlayStation. Oh, they and they made a lot of money because of it. Yeah, right, but they, they I, and I, I don't know, but I know that they want. I feel like they bought that because this is, it, at, a certain, at a certain point when uh, existing contracts are, are gone, um, 
I anticipate them making that move. I mean, it, it's like with Netflix. They they say that they're not really competing. They're, they're not competing with Disney+. Plus. They're not competing with just Hulu. They're competing with everything. Movies, books, uh, other television programs, video games. They're competing for eyeballs. And right. uh, I, I do think that's the business model moving forward is, you know, everything you talked about, about the, you know, the tremendous amount of money that Call of Duty can generate is really nothing in the grand scheme of a 70 billion. When, you when you're a company that can throw, a, throw around $70 billion, uh, everything else is just nickels and dimes. So um, th th these are crazy, insane numbers for us as developers, but in, in, uh, on the scale and the scope and the ambition that Microsoft has, that just doesn't move the needle. And uh, you know, it doesn't move the needle for them in terms of what their corporate strategy, which is to own the space. And you know, owning the space by owning all of the content creators or, or a number of the content creators is a great first move. And you know, exactly what they wind up doing with it, we have to do a TBD, but I, but I do guarantee you the conventional way of thinking about, about uh, profit and development, it is, it's gonna go out the window uh, it, because it, it's, it will no longer be that. We're paying 30 bucks a month or whatever, or whatever the, the platform's going to have, and then they're going to have to make sure they keep that as compelling and interesting and, and uh, fresh, have as much fresh content as possible. So now listen, all of this stuff I just said, I'm not an expert <laughs> at all. I'm just a, just a gamer, right. just a consumer speculating. So, you know, I hope I'm wrong uh, in, the term, in, in terms of, like, I do appreciate healthy competition between publishers like this, but at, at a certain point with the move they just made, you know, it might be tough for anybody to keep up. You know, Nintendo is an outlier, but um, they just they just changed the uh, they changed the, the space entirely with this purchase if it goes through. Well, let me let me ask you a question before we get up out of here, and then I'm gonna make this really really quick um, <laughs> because I definitely love the discourse and I definitely love hearing your takes on this stuff. Um, how does this fare for developers? Since that's what you are, you are a developer. How does this benefit you guys as a developer? As developers, so I've, I've actually spoken with some companies in, in the Microsoft uh, kind of ecosystem. Companies purchased by them, and um, it's great for them because they get to maintain their the, the few that I've spoken with. Um, they get to maintain their their culture, their you know their their autonomy, um, but they also have the guarantee they have guaranteed funding. So it, it's for the time being, it's something where to me it seems like the perfect world because you know it, I, I got the sense that there wasn't a lot of publisher overreach or, or even not much or any at all. So as a developer, that's the sweet spot. And to know that you don't have the same type of milestones where, hey, this company might not be here in six months if we don't hit this milestone. Uh, you know, those pressures go out, you know, they go out the window. So I think that um, it, it's positive for developers in that way. Uh, where it could be negative is they might then not have to be as um, uh, competitive or they, they may lose that killer edge trying to, you know, trying to be the game that has the distinction that sells millions of copies and is a huge breakout hit because they, you know, they're basically just looking to provide, trying to fill a hole, an hour's hole in this service, uh, you know, every couple of years. And um, I see it as, I, I see it as overall good, but developers will have to maintain their discipline to keep their eye on the prize. Okay. Gotcha. Fair enough. All right, well, we got a lot of insight today. And Jeff Ross, we need you to do us a favor. Go to Sony headquarters, beat everyone's ass, and tell them that you need Days Gone 2, man, so we can all be happy as <laughs> gamers and, you know, start chilling out. Oh, they, they won't let me in anymore, probably, if I show up. Uh, <laughs> I've said a lot of stuff on Twitter lately. So he's, done with, he's done with Dave Ruffy, right? <laughs> well, I'll say this before we go, man. I, really, I do appreciate you being here, man. You've been one of the, like, easier people to talk to. Cause I, I feel like what you you saying you are saying what you meaning, and, uh, and we, yeah. you're you're giving us um, honest opinion on what you what you believe, and that's more valuable than anything I think. Um, mm -hmm. To be that's... able to talk to people like humans and not like robots, and uh, I really appreciate that, bro. Awesome, uh, thanks for appreciating. thanks for really? picking up on that. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I say what I mean. It gets me in trouble a lot too. You're a down to earth guy, uh, Jeff. You've always come across extremely approachable and uh, you're very easy to talk to, like King Thrash said. So thank you, man. It's a pleasure yeah. to, and honor to speak with you here on this podcast. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for having me, everybody. Yeah, man. Take care, Jeff. I, I, got, I, got, I got to have you on a round table one day, man. I got to have you come to and uh, come eat with us. <laughs> yeah, reach, reach out. All right, we'll Christina, do. it was awesome being on a podcast with you finally. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah. Later, Tina. I'm going to see you guys later, right? <laughs> Take care. Peace. Yeah, see you later. All right. Bye, Bye guys. All right. Appreciate you.